we have people from Italy. We have people from um, Ireland, Australia, oh, England. Oh, fantastic. It's so beautiful. So well, the only issue is your Zoom can only hold 100 people. And I've been informed that yesterday about yeah. 200 were knocked off because it doesn't hold more than 100. I know. Next time, Father. But I, no, okay. Are we ready? I'll wait for you to upload the prayer. I keep looking over here to my right because I have a clock over there. I'm just looking at the time. I don't wear a watch. <laughs> I haven't worn a, worn a watch in, oh, 25, 30 years. Because in the divine world, there is no time. <laughs> <laughs> It's a bad joke. <laughs> okay. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Together, O Immaculate Heart of Mary, Mother and Queen of the Divine Will, I entreat you by the infinite merits of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, and by the graces God has granted to you since your Immaculate Conception, the grace of never going astray. Most Sacred Heart of Jesus, I am a poor and unworthy sinner, and I beg of you the grace to allow our Mother Mary and Louisa to form in me the divine acts you purchased for me and everyone. These acts are the most precious of all, for they contain the eternal power of your fiat, and they await my yes, your will be done. Fiat voluntas tua. So I implore you, Jesus, Mary, and Louisa, to accompany me as I now pray. I am nothing, and God is all. Come, divine will. Come, heavenly Father, to beat in my heart and move in my will. Come, beloved Son, to flow in my blood and think in my intellect. Come, Holy Spirit, to breathe in my lungs and recall in my memory. I accuse myself yes. in the divine will. I, place my, I love you. I adore you. Senti, senti, Lina. Mutati. Tutti ti sentono. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mamma mia, mamma. Smettila. I'm speaking to this woman that's got a microphone on in Italian. She understands Italian. I gave it to her right between the eyes. She gets my point. <laughs> so let's go back to fusing ourselves in the divine realm. I fuse myself in the divine will and place my I love you, I adore you, and I bless you, God, in the fiats of creation. With my I love you, my soul bilocates in the creations of the heavens and the earth. I love you in the stars, in the sun, in the moon, and in the skies. I love you in the earth, in the waters, and in every living creature my Father created out of love for me so that I may return love for love. I now, I'll wait for you to get to that part. You scroll down a little bit so people can see. Well, yes, you can do it, so I'll just continue. I now enter into Jesus' most holy humanity that embraces all acts. I place my I adore you, Jesus, in your every breath, Heartbeat, thought, word, and step. I adore you in the sermons of your public life, in the miracles you performed, in the sacraments you instituted, and in the most intimate fibers of your heart. 
I bless you, Jesus, in your every tear, blow, wound, thorn, and in each drop of blood of that unleashed light for the life of every human. I bless you in all your prayers, preparations, offerings, and in each of the interior acts and sorrows you suffered up to your last breath on the cross. I enclose your life and all your acts, Jesus, as my I love you, I adore you, and I bless you. I now enter into the acts of my mother Mary and of Louisa and place my I thank you in and Mary and Louisa's every thought, word, and action. I thank you in the embrace joys and sorrows of Jesus, redemption, and of the Holy Spirit's sanctification. Fused in your acts, I make mine. I thank you and I bless you, God. Love in the relations of every creature to fill their acts with the life and light. To fill the acts of Adam and Eve, of the patriarchs and prophets, of the souls of the past, present, and future, of the holy souls in purgatory, of the holy angels and saints. I now make these acts my own, and I offer them to you, my tender and loving Father. May they increase the glory of your children, and may they glorify, satisfy, and honor you on their behalf. Let us now begin our day with our divine acts fused together. Thank you, most holy Trinity, for enabling me to enter into union with you by means of prayer. May your kingdom come, and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Fiat. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Last uh, yesterday, we uh, acknowledged that God had intended from the beginning in his plan A creation to give everything, his very best, to his creatures, beginning with Lucifer, proceeding to Adam, proceeding to Mary, and so on. Lucifer, as we know, seized with rage, chose to snatch at equality with God. As Paul puts it in his letter to the Colossians, Jesus did not snatch at equality with God, Lucifer did. And this snatching at equality with God was the result of Lucifer not wanting to follow God's plan of incarnating himself in our low rational human nature. Now the question is, why did God choose us? Why did he not just content himself with such an intellectually endowed creature as an angel? And the answer is because God has it all. Nothing impresses God except filial obedience. Not blind obedience, filial obedience. God does not want us to blindly obey. Now, even the church teaches this. The church does not advocate blind obedience. Blind obedience means you're a robot. You don't think, you just execute on command. This is not the military heteronymous form of obedience that the church advocates. And the very word hetero heteronomy is used in the church's documents. And um, I can pull up a few for you here now that I'm on the subject. But um, uh, yeah, here's, yeah, I'll give you a couple of documents here by the church. One is Vita Consecrata, a consecrated life by Pope John Paul II, where he states that the church does not advocate blind obedience. And then you have, uh, let's see here. This one from Gaudi Metzbez. I don't know if I'm going to find it on the fly here. That's not allowing me to pull it up here. But the idea is that the church advocates an informed obedience. Consider, for example, the event of the apparition of Gabriel to the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
okay? When the angel of Gabriel appeared to Mary and said, you will conceive and have a son and he will be great and his name will be Emmanuel, God is with us. Now, what was her answer? Was it, sir, yes, sir? Or was it rather not, how is this possible? And that is informed obedience. So the church teaches in its documents that there must be a dialogue when an order is given, there ought to be a dialogue. Why? Because in order for us to fully give our fiat to God, we must engage both faculties of the soul, the intellect and the memory, not just, sorry, the will and the intellect. Now you may call it a passive intellect, active intellect, memory intellect. Aquinas only used two faculties when he spoke of the will of the soul, the intellect and the memory, sorry, the intellect and the will. Augustine spoke of three, the intellect, memory, and will. But they don't contradict each other. Basically, there's the active form of thinking, which is the intellect, and the passive, which is the memory, which contains all the data, information, experience. And God reveals to his mystics, from Louisa to Catherine of Siena to others, that these three powers of the soul are part of our, our, our human nature. And um, when we're given a command, God wants us to engage both the intellect and the memory. Blind obedience cancels out the intellect. It means I don't have to rationalize or reason. I just blindly execute. You lose merit if you do not engage the intellect when obeying an order. You lose merit. Because when you know what the order is meant for and adhere to it, you obtain more merit because you're lowering your intellect to the interests of the other intellect. So if God's divine intellect commands the human intellect of Christ to undergo his passion, despite him in the garden of Gethsemane saying, remove this chalice from me, yet not my will, but your will be done. Three times Jesus tells Louisa, he said this to the father in the garden of Gethsemane, three times. So he was putting the spirit to the test, testing if this was the father's will in his finite human nature that took upon itself, as I mentioned yesterday, a certain ignorance where he says, not even I know the day or the hour, only the Father knows, okay? So he always had to consult with the Father in his human intellect, even though he had the divine intellect in his divine nature. He chose not to have that always present in every moment, but to allow that to be revealed to him by the Father throughout the course of his life in his human nature. This is why Luke says Jesus had to grow in obedience, had to learn to grow in obedience through suffering, he had to grow in age, wisdom, and knowledge. That knowledge was being then downloaded, so to speak, from his divine intellect to his human intellect. And this is why at the Feast of Cana, when Mary told him that they have no more wine, he said, my hour has not yet come. And then she turned to the waiter and said, do whatever he tells you. Then he knew in that moment, my hour has come. And he performed his first public miracle and so forth. So um, Lucifer did not want to obey God's plan. He did not want to lower his finite, created, angelic intellect, however far it surpasses our human intellects, to God's uncreated intellect. So why did God choose us instead of an angel? Because it, God is not impressed by anything except filial obedience. That means that you can give God everything you want, all your talents, all your gifts, and still that won't impress God very much because he has it all. You're not giving him anything that he doesn't have. Everything you have comes from him, even your talents, even that which you develop in life, which is given in seminal form at conception is from him. And even the growth is from him. <laughs> and even your effort in making it grow is from him. St. Paul says everything is a grace, okay? So what impresses God then and why did he choose us? Because if we give him every day our will, which is completely under our control, he cannot control our will. That impresses him. The one thing that impresses God is the will, the free human will. And this is why he derives more satisfaction from us than from other irrational creatures like birds 
and animals and fish and however beautiful they are and express God's attributes. Even the elements like the water and the mountains, a beautiful sunset, they don't have the free will that we do. That we can give God because that is not under his control. See, God could have from the beginning made our will under his control like he did with all the animals. But he chose to leave this faculty free. And God, who is true to himself, will not go back on his word. So God has committed himself never to control the free human will. This is why if someone wants to be condemned, God will not change their mind. He will encourage them to change it, but he will never control their will and tell them what to do, okay? And um, this is why God chose us, because we are the lowest form of rational and volitional life throughout the entire cosmos. And it is God's penchant to, as Our Lady says in the Magnificat prayer, to cast down the mighty and lift up the lowly. Look at what Jesus chose as the means in which to incarnate himself. He could have chosen something very exotic like a pomegranate, all right, or a um, or one of these, what do they call them, star fruits from Asia, very pretty in appearance. Or he could have chosen something like caviar. <laughs> But Jesus instead chose something very simple and accessible to all, bread. He chose something very simple and accessible to all, like wine. Every land can pretty much cultivate wine and bread. Even arid land can cultivate wine. In fact, the best grapes are cultivated on the most arduous soils because they represent the growth of the human soul in virtue. If a child is spoiled, does not have any challenges, does not have to sacrifice, it grows up as an undisciplined individual. If a child grows up in a difficult life where it has to struggle and sacrifice, it grows up as a mature individual. This is why grapes that are grown in the most easy environments, they don't have to struggle through the harsh winter, are the worst wines. Those that have to go through the hot and cold are the best wines. God made this law in nature to symbolize the spiritual law of the virtues and growth. And I know this because when I lived in Italy for the first year in 1991, my community in Northern Italy where I stayed had two vineyards and we were, the seminarians were asked to cultivate grapes, harvest them. So we would go out about 5.30 in the morning when it was cold and, and frost was on the ground in late October, early November to harvest these four different types of grapes. There was um, rosé, rosé, red, black, and white. And we would have to separate them, cut them, of course, and then put them in the um, chestino, called like a, a bucket, empty the bucket into the back of a old truck, pickup truck, and it would transport it into the factory where would, they would separate the twigs from the skin from the pulp on a conveyor belt to create different types of wine based on what it's extracted from, whether the skin or the pulp. And um, uh, I remember there was a priest there. His name was Don Rosso, Father Red. And his nose was a little red. <laughs> but he was in charge of the vineyard. And uh, he told the seminarians, don't eat any of the grapes from the vine because we need these to produce the wine and we sell the wine and the proceeds we use for the selling of books and spiritual materials, etc. So the seminarians who were not yet in vows, <laughs> I think you know where I'm going with this. We're not in the vow of obedience yet. <laughs> Sometimes they would shake the vines and they would fall on the ground and then they would eat the grapes off the ground. So technically they weren't eating them off the vine. <laughs> the things seminarians do, I tell you. And anyway, um, I remember this because my hands from, we have like a little hook knife from cutting the grape, the grape clusters. My hands would be purple for like four months. I mean, once the grape gets in your skin, it's on it for several months. It's hard, impossible to get up. It goes beneath the cutaneous level. And it's, it's like a tattoo. Anyway, um, Jesus chose us because he chooses always the most lowly 
even in the form of bread and wine in which to incarnate himself, and in the people he chooses for the highest offices. Consider, for example, the greatest saints in the church, Mary. You could not have found at the time of Christ anyone who had lesser rights than Mary. First of all, women had no rights at the time of Christ. Second, she was a virgin found with child without a father. That's as low as you can get. She was worthy of being stoned to death if Joseph did not protect her. So God chose a woman who at the time of Christ had no rights, who was a virgin, which was considered cursed in the eyes of the Israelite community. If you were barren, you were outcast. Three, she was found with a child without a husband. That's three strikes. That's the one he chose in whom to incarnate himself. The lowliest, the most pushed aside of all was the Blessed Mother. He chose to make her the greatest of all. And the same thing he does with Lucifer in Genesis 3.15, with the first announcement of salvation. God tells Lucifer that a woman, right? Not even the head of the human race. A woman will defeat him, which is fulfilled in Revelation 12, the last book of the Bible. And the same applies to God's mystics. I'm going to share something with you that just popped into my head about exorcisms and the Blessed Mother, speaking of now Lucifer and Mary. Um, God uh, chooses a lot of mystics like Louisa, uneducated, to become one of the greatest saints in the history of the church. Catherine of Siena, uneducated. Faustina uh, Kowalska, not very well educated. Many of the mystics he chooses that are empty on the inside so that he can fill them without any interference, any brainwashing with his own doctrine. He doesn't want them to be influenced by the world outside at all. No influence on the outside. This is whom he chooses. The very simple, the lowly. Now, with regard to Satan and Mary, well, I worked under Father Gabriel Amo for several years. In fact, I, I assisted him and I remained in touch with him for over 20 years, from 1993 onward. And... Um, He, in During Exorcisms, makes it clear that the demons have roared, that the reason why there are far more possessions with women than men is because Satan seeks to requite the Proto-Evangelium. The Proto-Evangelium is in Latin, the first announcement of salvation, which is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, where God said, she will crush your head and you will strike at her heel. Because of this, knowing that a woman will defeat Satan in the end, Satan seeks to avenge himself by attacking women. This is a statistical fact. Over two thirds of diabolical possessions occur with women, not with men, because Satan seeks to revenge himself on Mary through the woman. Now, what does God do? In the Old Testament, there were only two female prophets. That's it. Three claim they were prophets, but it's not clear, but two for sure were prophets. So prophecy was a prerogative for 4,000 years just for men in the Old Testament. Okay. Then when God reveals to Satan that he will crush, a woman will crush his head, and the Savior is born 4,000 years later after this proclamation, and Mary is conceived before the Savior is born, Satan sets out to attack these women, okay? And from the 12th century onward, when exorcism stopped in the church, exorcism stopped in the 12th century for about 200 years. And that's when a lot of possessions increased. Um, prophecy became a prerogative more of the woman than the man. Around two thirds of women became prophets over men. So if Satan seeks to attack Mary by possessing two thirds of humanity, which are women, well, I should say, not say two thirds of humanity, by possessing people, two thirds of which are women, God has chosen to counteract Satan's attack on the woman 
by making now prophecy a prerogative of women, whereby from the 12th century onward, two thirds of the prophets have been women. Like Catherine of Siena, Julian of Norwich, and the list goes on, Faustina Kowalska, Luisa Picaretta, etc. So this is how God counteracts the dragon, Lucifer, who chose not to obey God's plan to incarnate himself in the lowest form of rational life on earth. Okay, now this is where we left off yesterday, and this is where I want to pick up this theme. I'll speak for a few minutes more before getting on schedule. Adam, since Lucifer forfeited his mastery over creation, was given this prerogative by God of being master, not just of all human generations, but king of all creation. And Jesus makes this abundantly clear in Louise's writings where he expresses to her how Adam, by bilocating his soul throughout the cosmos, was becoming the voice of praise, adoration, love, thanksgiving, honor to God on behalf of creatures that had no voice. So Adam was not only speaking on their behalf, but increasing their accidental glory and setting that portion of creation free that Lucifer had caused, caused to fall when he swept one third of the stars with him in his rebellion. And I mentioned yesterday this to you when I spoke of the angels, I'm um, sorry, the book of Revelation speaking of the angels sweeping one third of the stars, not the angels, it's the stars, meaning planetary structures and beings that inhabited these planetary structures. Now I'll go into that later today, not in this talk, I'll, I'll go into the book of Revelation chapter 17, the book of Revelation chapter 12, I'll go in order, chapter 12, 13, 17. I'll also go into the book of Daniel chapter 13, which is a parallel of Revelation 13 and 17, and unfold this mystical, symbolic, allegorical book of Revelation with regard to today's end times and the battle that is waging now between Lucifer and the woman. Mary and her offspring, who are the children who wish to live in God's divine will. Hello, everyone. During this break, we are going to pray together. And we're going to pray the Seven Sorrows Rosary until Father returns. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My God, I offer you this rosary for your glory, so I can honor your Holy Mother, the Blessed Virgin, so I can share and meditate upon her suffering. I humbly beg you to give me true repentance for all my sins. Give me wisdom and humility so that I may receive all the indulgences contained in this prayer. The Act of Contrition My God, I am heartily sorry for having offended you, and I detest all my sins because I dread the loss of heaven and the pains of hell, but most of all because they offend you, my God, who are all good and deserving of all my love. I firmly resolve, by the help of your grace, to confess my sins, to do penance, and to amend my life. Amen. Three Hail Marys. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The first sorrowful sword, the prophecy of Simeon. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The second sorrowful sword, the flight into Egypt. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary. Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. 
Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The third sorrowful sword, the loss of the child Jesus in the temple. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Father is here. We'll continue on the next break. All right. So this theme in today's Holy Thursday We'll continue where it left off yesterday with Adam being the crown of all creation. And I will also try to tie it into the event that happens today, where Christ on Holy Thursday institutes two sacraments, holy orders and the priesthood. Sorry, it's the same thing. Holy orders and the Eucharist. Okay. Now, let us first begin with Adam being the crown of all creation. Lucifer failed the test of consenting to God's plan that he should assume a human nature. And Adam failed the test of obeying God's prohibition of him partaking of one of the many fruits of the many trees in the Garden of Eden, where Lucifer was before Adam. And This meeting is being recorded. Okay. So, let us focus on two of these actions, of Lucifer and of Adam. They both had a challenge or a test before them. I think somebody has to mute. Again, I appeal to the host to mute people. All right, thank you. All right, so let me rewind. Let me go all the way back to the beginning. You know, by the way, somebody told me uh, something I didn't know how to do, and now I know how to do it. That is, go backwards in saying certain prayers like the Our Father. So you want to know how to say the Our Father prayer backwards? It's very simple. You do it like this. Our Father. That's a bad, bad way of beginning a talk on the divine will. But Jesus said that those that are of light heart and of good cheer are the ones that make him smile. (laughs) That is, if they do it without any foolishness or frivolity, if you want to call it that, frivolousness. Now, Jesus passed the test that Lucifer and Adam failed to, and that was do the will of the Father. Lucifer was supposed to consent to God's plan. Adam was to consent to his command. Jesus did both. Now, the Blessed Virgin Mary reminds us, when she gave her fiat to God, which was her test, how we can remain faithful in this test that God puts before us. Okay? So let us go to a work that has the church's official seals of approval, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Kingdom of the Divine Will book. It has the imprimaturs and the Nihil of Stats from the church. Day four, Our Lady states, while there was complete rejoicing and festivity between me and the Trinity. Now this is Mary in the womb of Anne, communicating with her intellect, Her brain is not yet formed, but her intellect is very much communication with the Trinity. I saw that the Trinity could not trust me if they did not have proof of my fidelity through a test. My child, the test is the flag of victory. The test disposes the soul for all blessings that God wants to give us and holds for us in safekeeping. The test matures and disposes the soul to obtain the greatest conquests. 
I too saw the necessity of a test. In exchange for the many seas of grace God had granted me. Isn't that a beautiful thing for Mary to say? Not only did she acknowledge that the test was necessary, but she too saw the necessity of a test for her. Why? Because God gave her everything and she didn't give him anything back except what he gave her. So she said, I want to prove my loyalty to you, Lord. I want to give you something you don't have. And that is something we should do. We should adopt this approach too. Feel, look, I want to prove myself to God. And this is what Mary was, is saying here. I wanted to offer proof of my love to my creator with an act of loyalty that would cost me the sacrifice of my entire life. I want to pause here and explain to you two schools of theology. One is incorrect and the other one naturally is correct on whether or not Mary could not sin. One school of theology teaches, and it's not approved by the church, it's a debate under, under um, review and there's no official teaching yet. One school teaches that Mary could not sin because if she did, the whole work of redemption would have went up in smoke. And what would have happened to Christ that Mary throughout her life changed her mind and walked away and said, I don't want to deal anymore with Christ or with St. Joseph. I want to live my life. Then what would have happened to the redemption? So they think because of that, Mary couldn't sin to safeguard the work of redemption. That's not true. Mary reveals right here in this book, she could have. If she could not have sinned, there would have been no sacrifice. Or the sacrifice would not have been, let's say, as great as it was if she could have sinned. But she could have sinned. Number one, theologically, because she was not God who could not sin. Every human, every creature can sin. That is a teaching of the church. Every creature can sin unless they are given the beatific vision. Then, only then. With the beatific vision, are they confirmed in grace that alone imparts, imparts to them impeccability, impassibility? So the beatific vision, immortality, infused knowledge, the beatific vision gives you these gifts. Unless you have the beatific vision, you don't have this. Mary did not have the beatific vision. This is the teaching of the church. You know, we render to God what's called latria in Latin, worship. We render to the saints. Dulia, which is veneration. But we render to Mary, who was conceived without sin, but still a human creature, hyperdulia, which is special veneration, because she's unlike any of us. But still, that doesn't give her the beatific vision. She had, like us, the intuitive vision, but she was elevated to a state of holiness and gifts beyond us by virtue of her office of motherhood and her immaculate conception. So Mary states here that. I, um, I wanted to offer proof of love to my creator with an act of loyalty that would cost me the sacrifice of my entire life. How beautiful it is to be able to say, you have loved me and I have loved you, but without a test, this can never be said. My child, the divine fiat revealed to me the fiat of the creation of man, who was made innocent and holy. For Adam too, there was complete rejoicing and festivity between him and God. He had command over all creation. Notice, she doesn't say over mankind. She says over all creation. And all the elements were obedient to his very not. By virtue of the divine will reigning in him, he too was inseparable from his creator. After God had bestowed upon him so many blessings in exchange for one act of his fidelity, he commanded him not to touch one fruit of the many fruits of the terrestrial Eden. Mary reveals, my divine child, sorry, my child, the divine fiat revealed to me the fiat of creation of man who was made innocent and holy. For Adam too, there was complete rejoicing and festivity between him and God. He had command over all creation, all creation. 
and all the elements were obedient to his very knock. By virtue of the divine will reigning in him, he too was inseparable from his creator. After God had bestowed upon him so many blessings in exchange for one act of his fidelity. Think of that. But just one act, okay? Mary had to sustain this one act throughout her entire life. That was what made her so great. Adam had to do one act. And I was saying no to either the serpent or to Eve. By the way, St. Thomas Aquinas teaches that even if Eve took of the forbidden fruit and sinned, if Adam said no to Eve, original sin would not have entered within the spiritual DNA of mankind. We would not have been conceived in sin if Adam did not sin, even though Eve did, because he was the root or the head of the human race. And as an infection enters the root and therefore through the root, the entire organism, had it not entered the root, it would have infected the branches or the limbs or the fruits or the leaves, etc. So Adam, all he was asked of his one act of fidelity. God commanded him not to touch only one fruit of the many fruits in the terrestrial Eden. This was the proof God had asked of Adam. Why? to confirm him in a state of innocence, holiness, and happiness, and to give him the right of command over all creation. But Adam was not faithful in the test, and as a result, God could not trust him. Now, this is something very beautiful and sad. We are asked by God through our catechism, through the church's teachings, through our parents' education, to observe the Ten Commandments. Once we are educated that way, do you know what? God trusts you more than you trust him. This is sad but true. And when you make a vow to God, whether it's marriage to a spouse or to the consecrated life, or even on New Year's Day or on your birthday or on the feast day of mercy, never to sin again or never to do this again or to improve some area of your life, when you pledge like that to God, he trusts you more than you trust him. And this is something to really ponder because this is how much authority he gives us. And this is why Mary says that um, even though God commanded Adam not to touch one of the fruit of the many fruits, this was the proof God asked of him to confirm him in his state of innocence. See, if God had seen that Adam said no, God would have confirmed him. He would not be able to sin. That's what confirmation means. But he didn't pass the test. Same with the angels. If Lucifer had consented to God's plan, Lucifer would have, would have been admitted to the beatific vision. But he never was. Adam was, I'm sorry, Michael was when he sided with God. But Adam was not faithful in, in the test, and as a result, God could not trust him. God could not trust him. So Adam lost his right of command over himself and creation and lost his innocence and happiness, whereby one may say that he turned the work of creation upside down. By remaining always unwavering in the test, God asks of you, which is the test of your loyalty. You allow God to accomplish his divine designs over you, and you reflect his virtues, which acting as many brushstrokes, transform your soul into the masterpiece of his supreme being. One can say that the test places within God's divine hands the raw material through which he accomplishes his divine designs in the soul. For God cannot do anything with the soul who was unfaithful in the test. On the contrary, such a soul disorders the most beautiful works of its creator. Therefore, dear child, be attentive. If you are faithful in the test, you will make your mother happy. So this is really the underlying theme.
theme of the whole history of Lucifer, the good and bad angels, two thirds good, one third bad, Adam and Eve, their offspring, it all comes down to whether or not they wish to pass a test. They're all given a test. They both failed. And now it's up to us to pass our test. Now, if Mary's test was giving her yes to God and sustaining that throughout her entire life without faltering, which she could have, but she did not do, what is our test? It is to keep the faith to the end. And this is why Jesus reveals to us through St. Faustina that even on your deathbed, you can still be saved. So God extends to us, therefore, in this Holy Week and on this Holy Thursday, one of the greatest sacraments you could ever ask for. And that is necessary for you to remain loyal in the test. It is the sacrament of confession. This is one of the greatest forms of exorcism the church extends to you. Father Ramoth will say this often, the, one of the greatest forms of exorcism is confession. It's the ex direct expulsion of evil from the soul. When the priest raises his hands, whether it's through the gridiron, the, 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 the screen, or, or, or directly over you, the blood of Christ is dripping from his hands. That was shut on Calvary that atones and expiates all sin. And in that moment, Satan, in the form of grave or venial sin, is directly expelled definitively from the soul. That's an exorcism, the direct expulsion of evil. Okay? But how many people go? And how often do they go? You know, less than 75% of the Catholics go regularly to confession. And you wonder why Satan's so active in the world today. Well, this is why. The number one reason is because they don't go to confession enough. St. Padre Pio said that you should go every two weeks to confession. This is what he told his benefits as a practice. And this is exactly what the church's code of canon law recommends, bi-monthly confession. And this is exactly what Pope Francis stated this year, he said, you should go to confession every two weeks. And some people think, and I've heard this said, well, I don't commit any crimes. I don't kill anybody. Why should I have to go so often? And this reveals an ignorance of the sacrament of confession because confession, yes, it takes away sin, but in addition to that, it infuses positive strength, whereby after having confessed even just venial sins, which is recommended by the church, you emerge with greater grace than if before you approach confession. This is a teaching of the Council of Trent. When you go to confession and you confess, whether it's grave or venial or both, doesn't have to be both, doesn't have to be grave, it could be just venial, you emerge after that sacramental confession with greater grace than before you had sinned. This is a teaching of Trent. Think of that. When you leave the confession, you emerge with more grace than before you committed the sins you confessed. Now, knowing that, who doesn't want to go to confession? And this now explains why Jesus told Louisa and Faustina to go off into confession. So, well, why? Jesus tells her she never committed one mortal sin in her life. Why does she have to go? Because it was not only restores you to grace, it gives you more grace than before you committed the venial or mortal sins you confessed. So every time you go to confession, you attain greater degrees in the divine will. You're flooded with grace. Yes, it expels evil, but it infuses more grace than before you sinned. By the way, the catechism also teaches about confession on the Holy Thursday in which it was instituted that there are two types of penitents, those that confess with attrition and those that confess with contrition. Attrition with an A is the fear of hell only, which is what Judas Iscariot had, which does not remove grave or mortal sin from the soul. It only removes a venial sins. 
The second type of penitent is those that confess with contrition, with a C, which is not just the fear of hell, but above all, the love of God. And this is what St. Peter had after he betrayed our Lord three times. Contrition takes away both grave and venial sin. It takes away mortal and venial sin. So the question is, how do I know I have contrition, love of God, and not just attrition, fear of hell? And the answer the catechism provides too. By making a firm resolution not to sin again, deliberately, intentionally, in that moment of the confession. That's contrition. So Judas had penitence when he threw the coins across the temple back at the Pharisees, when he realized that his plans had foundered. People say, oh, see, he repented, so he couldn't have gone to hell. He committed a great sin, Judas. First of all, this was a habit of his. According to tradition, he was a thief. He held the common purse of the apostles that he kept taking from them. And Judas and, his, and Jesus, in his great mercy, never let on to the apostles about this. Even at the Last Supper, when Jesus is asked by St. John the Beloved, who will betray you, Lord? He said, he to whom I hand this morsel of bread and dip it in the dish. And they didn't know what Jesus said to Judas. Judas, because Jesus whispered in Judas' ear after he handed Judas the morsel, what you were about to do, do it quickly. And Judas got up and left, and they all didn't know what happened. Jesus did not let on to the other apostles in his great mercy what Judas was up to. This is the love of God. He doesn't incriminate other people. He keeps it to himself. He internalizes the hurt. And he doesn't make people feel bad for it. He never says Jesus in scripture when people did wrong, I told you so, I told you so. He never did that. He was always quiet about that in his humility. And contrition, therefore, is what Peter had when he went back to the Blessed Mother after he realized, after Jesus was crucified and buried, his great sin. So G Judas, unlike Peter, instead of con confessing his sin and repenting with a resolution, took the easy way out. He killed himself. Why? Because he took the voice of Satan over the voice of God, which was telling him in his mind, your sin is unforgivable. You have no forgiveness. And therefore, there is no contrition for you. So he never made a resolution, Judas. You see, until you make a resolution, you're not contrite. So he took his life. He could have easily listened to the voice of God like Lucifer could easily have done so too and obeyed it. What voice would that have been? The many sermons Christ preached that Judas was a listener to. Whoever sins you forgive are forgiven. Judas was present for that. How many times Peter asked Jesus in the presence of Judas must I forgive? And Christ said, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times, which means an unlimited matter of times, so long as the person is truly repentant. Judas heard this and he could have done that, but he didn't listen to the voice of the shepherd, but his master's voice, which was Lucifer. Jesus knew this, and this is why Jesus said before Lucifer betrayed him, better for this man never to have been born. Anyway, the Lord um, uh, reveals to us that um, our test through the Blessed Mother, he reveals this to us through the Blessed Mother, our test is keeping the faith to the end. Now, some of you may be wondering, what is the sin against the Holy Spirit that is unpardonable, that Jesus speaks about? Pope John Paul II defines it. He, he answers that question when he refers to the teachings of the early church fathers and to the teachings of the church. The sin against the Holy Spirit 
it may assume different expressions, but in its essence, in its core, in its kernel, is despairing in God's mercy. Now, this assumes different forms. For example, Jesus may come to, to us with a revelation today of mercy. Come back to me, repent, and I will forgive all your crimes and I will forget them. This is true. When God forgives, he forgets. Now, I'll explain that more in detail in a moment, since the theme of this talk on Holy Thursday is also on the Institute of Confession, um, Sacrament of Communion, and of uh, the other one, which is the priesthood, okay? Um, when uh, Jesus forgives us in the sacrament, he expects us to make a resolution to, in this moment, not sin. Now, if we should sin, let's say two weeks from now, three weeks from now, it does not invalidate the confession because in the moment of confession, what matters is you are contrite and repentant and resolved. That's what matters. Even if later on you fall back, it's still a valid confession. Now, the sin against the Holy Spirit may assume a form whereby God reveals to us something today, like the divine mercy messages. I want you to repent, come back to my mercy. And people say, I don't need these prophetic revelations. God, we have, God has spoken to us in scripture and the catechism, that's enough for us. This is haughtiness. This is a wrong attitude. Because if God speaks, you should listen. Now, the question is, how do we know it's truly God that's speaking to us? And that's a valid question. Once the church authenticates it, then that's good enough, which it has done with the divine mercy messages, okay? Which it has done with the divine will messages. The hours of the passion have four imprimaturs, Nihil Upstats, the Blessed Virgin Mary in the kingdom of the divine will book has imprimaturs, Nihil Upstats. The first 19 volumes of Louisa were granted by her bishop and Saint Hannibal, the imprimatur Nihil Upstats. So how can you say we don't need this? That means you know more than God. And if in this message, you're rejecting God's word, you're rejecting the Holy Spirit. And this, depending upon how grave the rejection is, can in some manifestations constitute a sin against the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying everyone who doesn't read private revelation is sinning against the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying if a person persecutes these prophetic revelations approved by the church, they very well are sinning against the Holy Spirit. Yes, they are. Because remember what Jesus said when he brought up the sin against the Holy Spirit? What was the context? He, he was being accused by the Pharisees of performing miracles in the name of Beelzebub, of Satan. They were saying Satan is the author of these works, not Jesus. He said, woe to those who sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin is not going to be forgiven. This was directly related to those who were denying the revelation of Christ. But not just denying it, attacking it and associating it with revelations of Lucifer. Those who openly attack approved prophetic literature, say it's from the devil, in my opinion, that's a sin against the Holy Spirit. It's one thing to say, I don't need it. That's not a sin against the Holy Spirit. It's another thing to outright actively condemn it and attack it after the church has approved it. These people are walking on eggshells between heaven and hell. But God in his great mercy, and that's just one expression of the sin against the Holy Spirit. There are other expressions. In its essence, it's despairing in the mercy of God, whether it's through a revelation approved by the church or whether it's through a grace given by God, as was the case with Judas Iscariot. And it can ex assume different expressions. But Pope John Paul II now saying, defines it as that. But um, not to lose the, the thread here of my thought, when we go to confession and we are given this opportunity to contritely express our sins without holding anything back to God through the priest, God will extend to us his abundant mercy such that we leave with greater grace than before we had sinned. And the difference here I wish to emphasize between um, Judas and St. Peter is shame and guilt. Guilt is good. It leads us back to God. Shame does not. Shame does not lead us to repentance. 
it leads us only to blame ourselves and go into depression for the rest of our lives. Shame is like a circle, like the devil. He has, he's, you ever see these images of the serpent with the tail in its mouth, full circle? That's shame. It points the finger back at you. You did it, and it goes right back at you. And this is the devil. He leads you to sin. And then when you sin, he accuses you of sinning. Because the devil has a split personality. He's like a madman. He doesn't follow any logic. So he will say, go ahead, sin, sin, sin. And then when you sin, look at what you've done. He turns on you. And that is shame. Guilt is, yes, I'm sinned. Now I will go to God. I will go to my father's house and ask him to forgive me like the prodigal father to the son. Um, now, I mentioned when God forgives, he forgets. Um, and what I mean by this is that when we go to confession, all the sins are forgiven, grave and beneath. And we are not to deliberately hold back anything that we consciously know is a sin in confession. If we do, the whole confession is invalid because we're not opening up ourselves contritely to God. Contrite means being um, resolved and repentant uh, in a way where you're transparent, you're not holding private sins to yourself. And in that act of contrition, Remember, there are two things we confess. There are two ends, nature and number. The nature, is it grave or venial? The number, how many times? That's it. You don't go into details. You don't tell the priest the names or the places. It's forbidden, even for the priest to inquire these things. By canon law, it's forbidden. So all you have to do is that it confesses the nature and the number. Okay, that's it. And I, I, I'm not going to let this go by without throwing this in too. Unfortunately, not everyone is formed properly in how to confess. I've been to, I've, I'm ordained this year 25 years. May 24th, I celebrated my 25th year to the priesthood. And for 25 years, I've seen many confessions that were, how would I say, not carried out the way the church teaches. What I mean by that is sometimes a priest and a penitent will remain in the confession for 20 minutes and there are only 45 minutes of the confession and there are 20 people online. This is wrong. This is wrong. The priest and the penitent should know better. And the one of the two should end it relatively quickly. Five minutes, that's it. This idea of giving spiritual direction and counseling 20 minutes, this is not charitable to the other people that are waiting for the grace of God that you're neglecting them for. Um, you know, there's a place and a time for everything. If a person wants spiritual direction, they shouldn't take up the time in the confession on Saturday when everyone's going to confession. They should take time aside with the priest. Remember, spiritual direction is not confession. They're two separate things. A priest may extend a word of counsel after the penitent expresses his sins or her sins, and then he extends a penance and an absolution. That's it. And I also see this, you know, at retreats and pilgrimages, and I always make a point of making an announcement. Whenever I'm a priest and participating in a pilgrimage, and there were several priests that five minutes in the confession. If the priest wishes to talk at length more, to help more, then they can do that after the confessional in a private session and arrange that during the confessional. Like let's say a person hasn't gone to confession for 40 years and goes on a Saturday. The priest can absolve that person in five minutes and say, look, I would like to talk to you about coming to the church and I'd like to continue. If you're okay with it, you can meet me on a certain date. Easy, that could be done. You know. So, all right, without belaboring the point now, our test is keeping the faith to the end, even at the last breath, Faustina says. God is that merciful. Now, why did Lucifer and Adam have only one chance, whereas we have many chances throughout life? Because they had no temptation, no ignorance of the will, of the intellect, 
no deliberation of the will like we do. They had infused knowledge. They had immortality. They had immaculacy. We don't have these things. So therefore, when they sinned, they knew all the ends of their actions by infused knowledge. We don't. And this is why God is leaning more lenient with us than them and why he gave us by in this sacrament of mercy by instituting it, okay? Now there's a debate as to exactly when the sacrament of compassion was instituted. Some say in the first, Friday, the first Sunday after Easter on Dominican Albis when he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. Some say on Pentecost Sunday when the Spirit came down. Some say around this and the Last Supper. So this is open to debate as well. And my point is, I'm addressing this now because we are approaching the feast day of divine mercy after the sacrament of Easter, Easter Sunday. And I wish to, in this triduum, talk about preparing yourself worthily for both sacraments. Hope my computer is going to shut down in a moment. And I'm right at the end of the talk. Oh, so perfect, this, Father. Okay, so this is what I'll do. Take a 15 minute break and then resume in 15 minutes. Okie doke. Thank you. So Kathy. that means that is going to be quarter, maybe, um, okay. Maybe 10 to? Yes. Okay. I got that, everybody. Thank you. Hello. We hope you are enjoying and having a prayerful retreat with Father Dr. Iannuzzi. He has just finished up his second talk here on day two. And let's bring in Martha. Martha, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, this, this talk, he talked about the sacrament of confession. And one thing he mentioned was going every two weeks. Is that a practice of yours, Martha? Actually, I'm glad he brought that up because in the last six months, I have been very adamant about going every couple of weeks to confession. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wanted to mention that, yes, I do that as well. And um, maybe to share something, you know, and I think um, um, when I was younger, I was a little bit concerned about that. I thought maybe I was bothering the priest. He thought I was <laughs> going to be a religious fanatic, um, going there every single two weeks and bothering and wasting his time. And the devil puts all these things in your head. But I think growing... Uh, with Christ and in this gift, you say, you know, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what anyone might think of this. This is mostly in my head. And if it's not in my head, it doesn't matter. I'm going there every two weeks to receive the graces of the sacrament, to confess my sins to the Lord in the church. And uh, nothing's going to stop me from doing that. So hopefully that can encourage anyone who experiences any kind of obstacles to try to commit to this practice of going every single two weeks. Martha, I was wondering, um, before we start praying again and waiting for Father to come back, if you would talk about tonight. Tonight, there's a special presentation. Yeah, so tonight we are hosting the full 24 hours of the Passion as revealed to Luisa Picareta. So again, once again, asking all of you to join if you're able to, regardless of the hour, I will be there for most of it um, with many volunteers that are going to be participating. Of course, Dr. James and Larry, it's going to be a wonderful experience, a life-changing experience. And um, this is something we did last year. And remember that these hours are a bi-location experience, an experience with the Lord accompanying him through his passion. And we commit to stay as much as we can for these 24 hours. And we will read and pray these hours for an entire 24 hours. And anyone who can join us at any time, we will be here with many volunteers and many people at home, all praying these hours for 24 hours together. Um, and we are going to ask for God to deepen us in this gift and with mary we seek to play a part and participate in the restoration of all creation and it's a very special night for the church for all christendom for all of the cosmos and 
we hope you consider praying these hours uh, in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And also keep Father Inuzzi in your prayers. Um, let's keep asking the Lord to guide him and to keep working through him um, with spreading and promoting and deepening this gift in these very special times. Um, we don't know what the future has for us, but we want him to be protected and we want nothing to block what God is doing with his ministry uh, in these very special times that we are navigating through. And with that, I'm going to ask Martha to continue um, praying. And as soon as Father comes in for his third talk, we will go right to him. Mm -hmm. God bless you and fear. Let's begin where we left off, the third sorrowful sword of Our Lady, which is the loss of the child Jesus in the temple. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The fourth sorrowful sword, our Lord and our Lady meet as he goes on to Calvary. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, 
pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The fifth sorrowful sword, our Lord is crucified, and our Lady stands at the foot of the cross. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The Sixth Sorrowful Sword The body of our Lord is taken down from the cross and given to his most holy mother. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace. The Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. 
Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Most merciful Mother, remind us always of the sorrows of your Son, Jesus. The seventh sorrowful sword. Martha, Father, is ready to start his third talk. Okay. Thank you for your patience. And after this break, this meeting is being recorded. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fire of your love. Send forth your Spirit that we may be created, and you shall renew the face of the earth. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay. Picking up the theme where we left off on confession and God's mercy through the sacrament of confession. <clears throat> it was stated at the Council of Trent in the 14th session, in quotes, as a means of regaining grace and justice, penance, meaning confession, was at all times necessary for those who had defiled their souls with any mortal sin. Before coming the coming of Christ, penance was not a sacrament, nor is it since his coming as sacrament for those who are not baptized. But the Lord then principally instituted the sacrament of penance. When being raised from the dead, he breathed upon his disciples saying, Receive ye the Holy Spirit, whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven them. And whose sins you shall retain, they are retained. This is a quote from John chapter 20, verses 22 to 23. By which actions so signal and words are so clear, the consent of all the fathers has ever understood that the power of forgiving and retaining sins was communicated to the apostles and to their lawful successors for the reconciling of the faithful who have fallen after baptism. <clears throat> okay, so just wanted to clarify that point. Um, now, Mary reminds us that the test that we are given is keeping the faith to the end, observing the commandments of God, which is the will of God, and receiving the Holy Spirit, not just at baptism, not just at confirmation, but today. Remember, the Holy Spirit is alive. Jesus told the Pharisees when they accused him of claiming that he was older than Abraham, when he said, before Abraham was, I am, that the God that they worship is not a God of the dead, but of the living. Okay. So this Holy Spirit is alive today in us. And Adam stands out as the prototype for all of us who are called to receive from the Holy Spirit the gifts that Jesus wishes to give us, that he gave to his mother Mary, that he gave to Adam and Eve, that he gave to Louisa. Even before Jesus was born, he had obtain the graces, the merits for everyone of all time to receive the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in different forms, of course. <clears throat> so in the beginning, it was in its fullness before sin. And after sin, 
the outpouring was limited. What I mean by that is not that God gives himself in portions, but that the operation of the three divine persons was limited. Okay. And I mentioned this yesterday when I spoke of how in the Eucharist, Jesus is the only person incarnate, not the Father, not the Spirit. So he's the agent, the operator of that work of incarnation, not the Father, not the Spirit. Jesus alone became incarnate. Yes, the Father and the Spirit are inseparable from him, from him and therefore they concurred in that work of incarnation. The Father created the universe. He was the operator while the Spirit and the Son concurred. In the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in its fullness in these end times, all three divine persons are established within our soul and operate fully, but it's the work of the Holy Spirit. This outpouring of the Holy Spirit, namely of the gift of living in the divine will, was prepared by the Father and the Son through creation and redemption but it is fully actualized in these end times in us, thanks to the yes of Louisa, whom Jesus said was the first creature conceived in sin to fully possess this gift, and that anyone after her can fully possess it also. But once we receive this gift, which is the work of the Holy Spirit in which the Father and the Son concur, all three divine persons enter within us fully operational in the sense that the Father fully sustains the heartbeat and the will of ours when it operates when the heart beats, just like in Adam. The spirit fully breathes in us, like it breathed in the nostrils of Adam, giving him life, and recalls in our memory. And the sun fully flows through our life, blood and in our intellect, that same blood that would be shed in atonement for sin. So here we have a psychosomatic full possession of God in the human soul, whereby God fully possesses is the intellect, the memory, and will. But here's the difference, and it's similar to a diabolical possession to compare it to the two. We're all familiar with Hollywood and all of its uh, horror films. Many are familiar with the, with the block, but the block history, block, what do they call that? Block, block? <laughs> the, some block has uh, hit. Block, you have to help me here with Hollywood. They have these terms they use. Blockbuster. Blockbuster, thank you. I wonder why they call it a blockbuster. Maybe back then only people on the block went to the film. So a blockbuster film called The Exorcist, it was directed by Peter Blatty and it was based on a true story in Washington where I went and visited the place. And it happened to a boy that was played by a girl in real life, happened to a boy in real life, a Protestant family. And Hollywood, of course, made this really for the first time international news, a diabolical possession. And then many films followed after that, like the, the something of Emily Rose, I forget how the title in Hollywood, The Exorcism of Emily Rose. Another based on another true story, a woman in Bavaria by the name of Annalisa Michel, and so forth. Now, um, we know from Hollywood that the devil possesses what people see, what people say, their strength, their knowledge of language, of prophecies. Hollywood reveals this to us. The devil has this ability. But what the devil does not have, which Hollywood does not reveal, is the ability to possess the human will. The devil does not have this. Never did, never will. God has made the human will free. And this is really where the test and the battle is wrought. The battle is waged right in the will, because that is the faculty completely free. Even in a person who's diabolically possessed, their will remains free to some extent cooperate with the exorcist. And this is where Hollywood deceives you. It makes the, di the diabolically possessed person appear that they have no control over their free will. That's not true. And the Hollywood does this for reasons, to make Lucifer appear more powerful than he is. Even St. Thomas Aquinas says that Antichrist, this evil individual male that the early church fathers spoke of, when he appears, will not be able to do anything but that which God permits. Even Antichrist and Satan himself have powers that are only permitted by God. 
they're held in check. So God cannot, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> so Antichrist cannot do whatever he wants with anyone. I want to see if I could find that quote by Thomas Aquinas. Um, doubt if I'll pull it up on the fly, but I'll try. If not, I'll just move on. Yeah, I'll move on. Uh, the Catechism refers to this in Article 676 by the Antichrist deception um, being at work in the world. Now, when God possesses us, when we receive the gift of living in his divine will, the same similar dynamism, ha dynamism ha happens. He possesses our intellect, our memory, and our will, but he doesn't violate the free will. It remains free. If he did possess it to the point where he controlled it, we would be in the beatific state. We could not sin, but we can, even living in his will. So could Louisa have, so could Mary have, but they didn't. That's what makes this gift so um, powerful and greater, I should say, imparts a greater state of nobility to its recipient such that it trend, uh, supersedes that of the angels and saints in heaven who cannot sin. Jesus tells Louisa in these writings on the volumes that um, to, to live in my will on earth is to enjoy the same interior state as the blessed and saints in heaven. But since in heaven they do not suffer or obtain merit, those who live in my will on earth who can suffer and obtain merit Give me greater glory than the angels and saints in heaven. Jesus tells this to Louisa. If you have the dissertation, this is found on page 76. Jesus reveals, my daughter in heaven, the blessed give me much glory because the perfect union of their wills with mine is one. Their life is a product of my will. There is so much harmony between us that their breath, inhalation, movements, joys, and all that which constitutes their beatitude is the effect of my will. However, I tell you that for the soul who is still on earth and united to my will in such a way that it never deviates from it, its life is heavenly. And I receive from this soul the same glory that I receive from the blessed in heaven, or rather, I take more pleasure and delight in this pilgrim soul on earth because what the blessed in heaven do, they do without sacrifice and with delight. Whereas what the pilgrim soul on earth does, it does with sacrifice and emit sufferings. And where there is sacrifice, I take more pleasure and I am more delighted. Since the soul who is still in a, pil a pilgrim and lives in my will forms one life with the blessed who live in my will, the blessed in heaven themselves participate in the pleasure I receive from the pilgrim soul in my will on earth. Okay, there's that passage. That's how powerful it is. So Adam on earth, you're starting to understand why he was elevated to a greater state of nobility than the angels and saints, because he was able to obtain this glory that they themselves could not obtain for themselves or for God. Okay, so Adam, I want to talk about him now and his test that he had to pass because we too have to pass a test of loyalty to God. Adam was to possess and convey what God gave him to his offspring. Jesus refers to these as the seed, the first plantings. Remember, Adam was to construct a kingdom within his soul that he failed to construct. Louisa, Mary and Louisa were the only creatures that succeeded in constructing a kingdom in the divine will that was intended by God that contained all the acts of the angels and of the saints and all creatures known and unknown throughout the cosmos for all time and indeed throughout eternity. Remember this, the soul, is it, its expansion is limitless. And this is what I referred to you earlier yesterday when I spoke of Adam having voids or caverns in his soul that had to be filled with divine acts that emitted divine light, that produced divine light within his soul, his humanity. Just as Christ's pains, joy, sorrows produced a light within his humanity. Okay. 
So I want to talk about how we, in doing our acts in the divine will, help develop this kingdom, establish this kingdom, and invite the three divine persons to fully operate within us. So from the motions of the sun, the stars, and the earth, the more, which are, let's say, not as meritorious as human actions, we are all called to assimilate and embrace within ourselves all creation. How? By doing what Adam did. And the word Jesus uses is by locate himself within creation, namely his soul. Jesus reveals to Louisa in volume 13, October 9th, 1921. And I spoke about Satan not possessing the will, God not, I'm sorry, God possessing the will, but not violating it. I'll share with you this passage that ties these themes together. Meaning the will is the repository of all the divine acts we perform that engender divine light within us and that establish a kingdom, and that God wishes the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to dwell with it. The Father wishes to possess the will, the Son, the intellect, the spirit, the memory, but they all live within our soul, which has these three powers of the intellect, the memory, and the will. So on October 9, 1921, Jesus tells Luisa, I'll first tell you what he tells her in Italian, then I'll translate it. La volontà nell'uomo è quello che più assomiglia al suo creatore. Nella volontà umana ho messo parte della mia immensa immensità e delle mie potenze, dandole il posto d'onore, l'ho costituito regine di tutto l'uomo e depositare di tutto il suo operato. Here he's telling her that it is the will of man that makes him more like his creator. In the human will I placed part of my immensity and power and giving it the place of honor, I constituted it queen of man's entire being and the repository of all of his acts. Now, when we see in Hollywood Satan possessing a person, they cannot possess the will. The will is like a door in a home and there's the handle is only on the inside. Satan, in order to enter us, has to go through the will. So what does he do? <clears throat> He starts to buffet the door with external forces like wind, sleet, rain, hail, make noise, bang against the door with these elements. So that we being annoyed, go and open up the door. That's how we let him in. So the devil can enter our intellect and our memory without our consent. He can produce images, patterns, words, thoughts in the intellect and in the memory, in dreams and when we're awake, and we have nothing to do with that but he can never enter the will without a consent. It's like a door with a handle on the inside. Have you ever seen that famous painting of Jesus by a garden knocking on a door? It's an archway door and it's wooden and he's knocking and there's no handle on the outside. You notice that? Because that door represents the will. We cannot let him in. He cannot force himself in. We can only open it from the inside with our consent. Same with the devil. So Jesus therefore tells Louisa from the same passage, in one instant, the will can will a thousand goods and a thousand evils. The will makes man's thoughts fly up to heaven and to the farthest places, this is the galaxies, deep into the abyss, even into purgatory, but may be prevented from externally operating, oh, sorry, man may be prevented from externally operating, speaking or seeing, but he is always capable of doing all these with his will. Whatever man does or wants forms an act that remains deposited within his own will. This is very powerful because this is exactly what, where the divine will happens, right in the will. Whatever man does or wants, meaning with the will or with the intention, does the will, he desires it, wants with the intention, forms an act that remains deposited within his will, remains. Oh, how the will can be expanded. How many goods or evils it can contain. This is why among all things, I desire the will of man. For once I have acquired this, I have acquired everything. The fortress is conquered. And this is why Jesus tells Louisa, 
of these three faculties, the will is the most noble, more noble than the intellect, more noble than the memory. This is the likeness of God. It's the ability for the will to multi-locate with the consent of the intellect and with the experience and, and, and the um, information of the memory to throughout the entire cosmos, glorifying God in and through all things, uh, making satisfaction for bad actions of the past of creatures, including our own, those present, those in the future. It's glorifying him for those done well and drawing them all from Christ through Mary. So you may consider that <clears throat> um, God made Adam king of all creation, whose divine acts were intrinsically ordered to the betterment of all creation through his realms. Just as a bank's treasury contains precious metals of its investors, right? So within the treasure trove of, of Adam's divine acts were to be found the treasury of the divine acts of all creatures. Adam's treasure trove of divine acts was formed by the perfect union of his human will with God's divine will before sin. And having made the will the first created human repository and the treasure trove of all of man's acts, God ordered the human will of Mad Adam to the betterment of man's entire being. So how did Adam do this? How did he create this kingdom within him through the exercise of his divine acts by uniting his will to God's divine will, by continuously offering up his will in every act to the, the will of the Father, to the will of the Son, to the will of the Holy Spirit. They have one will, all three divine persons. Remember when Jesus came to earth, he took upon himself a second will. So his human will had to consent to the divine will. Adam had one human will and he consented to the three divine persons one will. So here's a little question for you, a little theological trivia for you theologians there in the listening audience. How many persons are there in God? It's a trick question. <laughs> how many natures are there in God? Now, if you say three or one, you're right, but you have to qualify. Let me specify the question. How many persons are there in the triune God? Ah, there are three. How many persons are there in Jesus incarnate? Only one. See, that's why it was a trick question. When you say God, do you mean God the Trinity or God Jesus Christ? Okay, second question. How many um, natures are there in the Trinity? There's one. Three persons, one nature. How many natures are there in Jesus? Two. So one nature in the Trinity, two natures in Jesus Christ. Three persons in the Trinity, one person in Jesus Christ. And in us, in Mary, in Louisa, mm -hmm. how many persons, how many natures? There is one person in all of us. And it's not a divine, it's a human. Mary had a human person only. And we all have a human person only. We don't have a divine person. If we did, there will be a divine quaternity with Mary, right? And how many natures in us? Only one, it's human. So you have one human person, one human nature. We participate in the divine nature, okay? Now here's something that is unheard of in theology. I'm going to try to pull this up. Sometimes when I talk, some ideas come and that leads me to try to pull up a quotation. And that's why with your patience, eventually um, I, I, I Eventually, how I hope to find these. Um, let me see if I can find this. Uh, I found it. March 24th, 1903, volume five. Tell me what is new in theology about this phrase. Remember the theology, three persons in the Trinity, one nature. Two natures in Jesus Christ, one person. In us, one human person, one, one human nature. We participate in the divine nature. Now, listen to this statement of Jesus. This is new, theologically. My daughter, the soul who wants to remain in my will, always keeps my own person within itself. Hmm. 
always keeps my own person within itself. You just said we have a human person. So how can we have a divine person within us? He's talking about abiding, not in our person, but in our nature. This is a new presence that has been actualized beginning in the late 1800s, starting with Louisa and moving full force onward. Other saints after Louisa have had this triune presence within them. All three divine persons dwelling within their soul, the father in the will, the spirit in the memory, the son in the intellect. Louisa experiences full, fully operational presence of the three divine persons in her through the three faculties of her soul. Mary did too. Adam and Eve had this before sin. After her sin, this triune operation in all three faculties was suspended for 6,000 years. Yes, we received the presence of the Trinity with baptism, but the operation in its full force is different than just the presence, see? Now, Jesus tells Louisa, um, although the soul can go out of my will, since I created it with a free will, my power operates the prodigy of administering to it continuously the participation in my divine life. This is a living host. We have the perpetual presence of Christ in us 24 seven. It's the same real presence in the Eucharist in us. Jesus refers to this as real life, capital R, capital F. In the Council of Trent, it revert, referred to the Eucharist as real presence, capital R, capital P. There's no difference between the two. Jesus and Louisa, Jesus and the Eucharist, no difference. Theologically, there's only one small distinction. In the Eucharist, it's only one divine person indwelling in the bread and wine in the tabernacle. Only one divine person, Jesus. Uh, he's inseparable from the Father and the Spirit, but he's the agent who's indwelling. He's incarnate. The Spirit's not incarnate. The Father's not incarnate, but they're present in his nature. They're one nature, three distinct persons, but his person indwells in the, in the host. But the presence of the other two are there as well in, the, in his nature. In Louisa, that same person, Jesus Christ, brings with him the person of the Father, the person of the Spirit, and all three dwell in her soul, in her one human person. Her soul is not part of her person. Her soul is part of her nature. So remember, we have a human person and a human nature. In Mary, in Adam and Eve before sin, and in Louisa, when she received this gift, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as persons, began to indwell within her will, intellect, and memory. That's her soul. That's her nature. While she retained her human personhood. And this is why Jesus says here in volume five, the soul who wants to remain in my will always keeps my own person within itself, meaning within its intellect. The son is in the intellect. The father is in the will. The spirit is in the memory, fully operational. It is by virtue of this continuous participation that the soul receives, that it experiences such strength and desire to unite itself with my divine will, that even if it wanted to separate it, itself from it, it would not. This is the continuous virtue of which I spoke to you the other day, which issues forth from within me and is communicated to the soul who always does my will. Now, this is the soul in its advanced stages of living in the divine world, not the soul that's just entering. Okay, so Jesus talks to Louisa of the different ways in which a soul can live in God's divine will. <coughs> and I'll talk to you in the next talk about that the different ways in which a soul can live in God's divine will. But let's go back to Adam. So I just wanted to deviate for a moment there and talk about how Adam's divine acts, united with God's one divine will, produced light within his humanity to form a kingdom, particularly within his will, which is the repository of all the thoughts, words, and action human nature does. By continuously bilocating his soul within all created things, Adam reflected God's light throughout the cosmos. He offered acts of praise and worship on behalf of his creator 
and maintain in himself the divine order of creation. Jesus reveals to Louise in volume 24. On August 12, 1928. My daughter, my will is order. And then in the soul in whom it reigns, it establishes its divine order. By virtue of this order, the soul feels order in its thoughts, words, works, steps, and everything works in harmony. The divine will maintains order in all the works that the supreme being brought forth, and they are so intimately linked together that they are rendered inseparable. While each work has its distinct office, by virtue of this order, the union to which the one work is ordered is such that it can neither live nor act without the other, and the one, and one is the will that moves them and gives them life. Likewise, by virtue of the fiat, the soul feels within itself the order of its creator, and is so linked and united to him that it feels inseparable from him and transfused in him. Now, every loving act of worship Adam rendered to God served to maintain this divine order throughout the cosmos that God had put there. Everything God made was beautiful. It says in the book of Genesis, God made everything good. Then comes Lucifer and he falls and then the earth becomes a formless wasteland. And we find the same expression in Ezekiel. This is the result of the fall of the angels. But in the beginning, it was not so. But God preserved among this disordered one third of creation that fell, one third of the stars fell of creation. He preserved in that two thirds a garden of Eden. But Satan had access to it because even before Satan fell, he was in Eden, as we find in Ezekiel. And this is why God allowed Lucifer there, and not just because he occupied it before Adam, but also to be the test for Adam, so that in passing the test, Adam could be confirmed in a state of glory. And the same applies to us today. You know, we spoke a little bit in the Q&A yesterday about why, you know, there's this, these things going on in the world today in the church. The reason is that God wants us to coexist with evil. This is part of our journey. He sent them out, not to take us out of the world, but to remain in the world like sheep among wolves. Why did God not take them out of the world? Because there would be no test, no way to prove our loyalty. If everything's easy, there's no, no challenge. So that's why the darn will have to grow with the wheat. The whole purpose of this is to prove ourselves in love to the end of the world. Then the harvesting happens and the wheat, the shaft is separated from the wheat, etc. And the wheat is taken to heaven by the angels and the shaft sent to the, you know, the fires of hell. So Adam had to um, enliven creation this beautiful garden and the two thirds of all creation and repair for the one third was contaminated by Lucifer with his divine act. He had to restore that glory that Lucifer did not give to God along with a third of the creation that did not give that glory to God either. So you see, Adam wasn't just redoing the acts of human beings. He was doing it of all creation. He was given this infused knowledge. And he had to impart this life to all creatures, We're not only maintaining the divine order, but restoring it too, to set creation free to those parts of it that were enslaved by Satan. And here, Louisa introduces us to the mystery of God's having imparted to Adam the principle of universal life and virtue. This is an expression that is used in volume 24, August 12, 1928. By the power of God's will operating in Adam, all creation, and indeed, the entire universe received life, life, and sustenance from Adam. It was from God through Adam, like we receive all grace from Jesus Christ through Mary. To better illustrate this point, consider a wealthy father who entrusts to his son an estate, a uh, patrimony, a uh, inheritance that provides, let's say, health care to the lives of all of the millions in the center of health that improves people's physical welfare. So the father's happiness is met in seeing his son occupying this health center and governing it wisely, governing it wisely as, as its head while maintaining the health of those entrusted to him. Well, <clears throat> analogously, Adam was to occupy the terrestrial paradise 
and from there bilocate his love for God in all the created things that God had placed at his service and enliven creation with the divine light and life God had placed within all creatures. And the purpose of God's being in Adam was to give Adam the very eternal quality that God had. God indwelled within Adam, the father, the person of the father, the person of the son, the person of the spirit, all indwelled within his soul, like it did in Mary and Louisa. Vesting Adam's acts with this divine order that's in God to form in his soul a kingdom that was to become um, the standard for all other, all other souls to follow, the head of all other kingdoms of human beings that would be realized in time. Louisa illustrates this truth in volume 14, September 9th, 1922. Jesus reveals, my joy reached its peak in seeing in this man, Adam, the almost endless generations of many other human beings who would provide me with as many other kingdoms as there would be humans who exist and whom I would reign, in whom I would reign and expand my divine boundaries. And I beheld the bounty of all other kingdoms that would overflow for the glory and honor of the first kingdom, which was to serve as the head of all others, as the prime act of creation. Okay? So in this text, this endless generations God beheld in Adam is predicated upon the principle of this unity that we're all connected to the beginning. Um, Adam's first acts, Jesus tells Louisa, will remain because they are eternal acts that are one with God. They cannot be separated from God. He calls these in Italian primi atti. Um, and they were performed by God himself, these first acts, because Adam didn't know how to act. Jesus tells this to Louisa in volume 13, April 18th, 1930, and then in many other volumes like May 13th, 1924, February 11th, 1926, May 25th, 1929, and so forth. But I'll just share with you April 18th, 1930. He says that uh, we, the Trinity, our love reached such an extent that um, we, Adam's creator, accomplished in him every one of his first acts. So the first act of love was created and accomplished in him by us. The first heartbeat, the first thought, the first word, in sum, the first acts we, the Trinity, accomplished in Adam and empowered in him everything he would later do. For upon our first acts followed those of Adam. And this is found also in volume 26, January 5th, 1936. And because of these acts being of God in Adam, they are remain in eternity and our acts are linked with those of Adam. And this is why Jesus tells this to Louisa. Um, that we are linked by entering into the one eternal act of God through Mary and Louisa to those of Adam. Um, okay, I think I'm at the end of the 45 minutes. So we'll take well, I have about four more minutes. Let's do this. In these last five minutes, let's open up the floor to a Q&A. And again, if you can raise your hand as explained yesterday in the introduction on how to use the hand icon or the chat, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Okay, um, bring on the questions. Please explain substituting for other for others. <clears throat> yes, I touched upon this yesterday. <clears throat> and I quoted to you from volume 11, October 1914, where Hannibal relates, if the soul's domestic obligations do not allow it to continuously and attentively meditate the hours of the passion, it may substitute the disposition of its goodwill with that of Jesus 
to continuously meditate them and intercede for the salvation of all souls. Now, what does this mean? It means that which Louisa was told by our Lord when she couldn't finish her rounds properly. And the Lord told her when she was suffering so much, she couldn't begin her rounds well or end them, that your making an effort to start them was beginning the rounds and your sorrow for not completing them was completing the rounds. In other words, when we cannot finish something we want to do because our domestic obligations, not because our distractions or entertainments get in the way, no, because our obligations get in the way, things we have to do, we can say, Jesus, can you finish this for me? I substitute your will with mine to do the rounds I intend to do. While I focus on doing this, I ask you to continue where I left off. That's substituting the disposition of our goodwill with that of Jesus to continue in us what we can do. We could do this with Mary. You know, when she was also <coughs> with Louisa administering Jesus' blood throughout creation for the redemption of mankind. Okay. So hopefully that answers that question. So we also have a question, uh, Rhonda. Rhonda, you yes, can I'm unmuted. Uh, yes, Father, um, I'm a convert from Judaism, and um, when you were talking about salvation and the sin against the Holy Spirit and confession and so on, how does that apply to those who are not Catholic? But also, I, I'm concerned, especially for my children and others who are Jewish and were never. Yes, Christian. beautiful question. I give you two sources that provide the answer. The first is Lumen Gentium, a Second Vatican Council document, which in English means the light of the people, Article 16. The second source is the Code of Canon Law, Article 844, okay? So I will now try to pull that up and um, explain that to you. Thank you. Um, this comes, then you can find this also on the Vatican website, Lumen Gentium. Has it in different languages too. I'll scroll down here to Article 16. Here it states <clears throat> Those who have not yet received the gospel are related in various ways to the people of God, the Catholic Church, and the, those that are baptized, the people of God. In the first place, we must recall the people to whom the testament and the promises were given, and from whom Christ was born according to the flesh. On account of their fathers, this people, the Jews, remain most dear to God, for God does not repent of the gifts he makes, nor of the calls he issues. But the plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the creator, which include the Muslims, who profess faith in Abraham, along with us adore the one merciful God, who on the last day will judge mankind. Nor is God distant from those in shadows and images seek the unknown God, like those in the Amazon, or those who do not follow Christ or follow Pachimama. For it is he who gives to all men life and breath and all things, and as Savior wills that all men be saved. Those also can attain to salvation, who through no fault of their own do not know the gospel of Christ or of his church, yet sincerely seek God, and moved by grace, strive by their deeds to do his will, as it is known to them through the dictates of their conscience. So what does this mean? It's the natural law that Thomas Aquinas speaks of too. When we are conceived in God's image and likeness, we are given a natural law. This is the voice of our conscience. We do not need to be told not to kill our parents as children. Why? Because we know it's wrong. Well, who told us? Nobody. That's our conscience. Killing is just something that's against our good nature. When we violate that, we sin, regardless of our creed. Let me ask you a question. How were the people judged from the time Adam was expelled from Eden to the time the law was given to Moses? These are 2,000 years with no law. Think of that. From the time of Christ to now is 2,000 years. Imagine all these generations, 2,000 years with no law. This is what it was like for the first human beings on the planet after Adam. They had no law for 2,000 years. How are they judged? By their conscience. 
Jesus reveals this to Catherine of Siena in the book Il Libro, which is today translated as the Dialogue of Divine Providence. God the Father and Jesus speak to her and tell her that people went to hell even before the law of Moses was given, or they went to Abraham's bosom. Whether they respected their conscience, not knowing the gospel, not knowing the true God, by following the dictates of their conscience that I put there, or by violating that, by doing evil and stealing and killing, which I did not put there, the devil put that there. So this is how these people who do not know Christ or the gospel are saved, by they following the dictates of their conscience, okay? Amen. And the church also, and the church also refers to these three types of salvation as baptism of sacrament, baptism of desire, this is desire, or baptism of blood, which is martyrdom. You're welcome. Okay. And Canon 844 talks about how all Christians baptized can receive three sacraments. But when it comes to those that have not have the sacraments, this is how they can attain salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Thank Father. you. Thank you very much. Father, okay. I have a question. Um, it, it's regarding your earlier talk today on um, the test, the test of yes. uh, um, Adam and so forth. And it, it could produce good or it could produce evil, right? Uh, I mean, like you know, the test is important for each and every one of us. In the Our Father prayer, maybe it's my perception, but it says, do not lead us to temptation. And some languages, they translate that as to do not, do not lead us to the test. Is that something completely different in meaning? It can be. Okay. It can be. But do you see yes. where I'm coming from? I do, yeah. Yes. The devil will, will tempt us, and that can be a test for us. But not all tests are temptations. Mm -hmm. All temptation are tests, but not all tests are temptations. Sort of like all popes are men, but not all men are popes. <laughs> Oh. Um, now, how is the difference? What's the difference? The Gospel of Luke says that the Holy Spirit, not the devil, thrust Jesus into the desert where he would be tested or tempted. It says tempted. Now, why would the Holy Spirit lead Jesus into the desert? It doesn't say the Holy Spirit tempted. God cannot tempt us. It's impossible. Satan can tempt us. But God wills for Satan to tempt us. Why? because it's our test to prove our loyalty. We have to pass a test. And it oftentimes comes through evil, which is a temptation. But God doesn't produce the temptation. He permits it so that we could pass a test. That's why God allowed Satan to test, tempt Adam and Eve. That's why God allowed Satan to test, or you say tempt Mary, even though she had no concupiscence and she was immune from sin, like Adam and Eve, when Satan's threw her out of house and home, basically, when Herod wanted to kill them. And they left for about 80 years to northern Egypt, probably Alexandria, where there was a big, big Jewish community until Herod died. And where many times he tried to um, stop her from going ahead with the work of redemption, where she lost her son you know, for three days. He was probably playing, trying to play with her mind there for a while. And she was fighting. And of course, you could see this beautiful description of how she's pleading to the angels, where is my son? Please tell me where is he? And uh, she was um, a little bit beside herself there. But, um, in answer to your question, um, that's the distinction between, between the test. God wills the test, Satan wills temptation. And God permits Satan's temptation so that we could pass the test. So you can make a choice. Okay, the next question, explain please trans, transubstantiation into Mary in divine will. Whoa, where did that come from? <laughs> <laughs> okay, when you combine that H2SO4 with an NaCl2 and then compare it with the photographic plates of the sun, you get the equation E equals M over C squared. <laughs> 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 All right, so combine Mary with transubstantiation, then what is it? <laughs> How does that go again? Can you repeat that? Okay. Um, please. Explain, please, transubstantiation into Mary in divine will. Okay, what I think um, the question is alluding to is, how does Mary become a living host? Just like Jesus became a living host. Jesus is the Eucharist. 
he bilocated his own presence, which is the indwelling of the Trinity, in personified in the person of Christ, the second person, the Trinity, in matter, in bread and in wine. Okay, that's transubstantiation. Christ, with an act of his will, a fiat, and the Father's will consenting, bilocates his presence. Why did Christ do this? He loved us so much. He loves us so much. He didn't want us to be orphans. He could have left and come back 3,000 years later. He said, no, I don't want to leave you orphans. I want to leave a perpetual presence of myself here with you. Even though I know I'm going to be abandoned by the vast majority alone in the tabernacle in the dark, I still want to do it for those few. Why? Because those few will recompense the loss of adoration and respect I receive from the masses. So I will draw, draw from those few who spend themselves before me as victim souls, all the glory that the, all the other souls should have given me, okay? Now, Mary, the prototype of the future church of the will of God on earth, the new Jerusalem come down from heaven. <coughs> um, she received the same indwelling that Christ received when he became man. The three divine persons were fully present and operating within her as they were, and no less than they were in Christ. She was a living host, even before the Eucharist was consecrated. She possessed the fullness of the Trinity. That's why the angel Gabriel said, hail, full of grace. She was the fullness of the expression of the Trinity in matter. And as God's masterpiece, when Christ instituted the Eucharist, even though Mary was not physically present, she experienced this because her soul bilocated in everything he did. This is present throughout the church approved hours of the passion that bear the imprimaturs and the heel of stats of the magisterium. And then when Christ consecrated himself, right, he communicated himself first to himself. And then he communicated himself to the apostles. And uh, some mystics say that he communicated himself also to Mary in that moment mystically. That she received him as well, even though she was from at a distance. And this is not possible. This has been done before in the history of the church, where um, someone can take a host, an angel or God himself, and communicate this to someone else. Uh, Jesus did this with some saints who were deprived of communion. He gave them it. Even confession, when they didn't have a priest available, sacramentally, he absolved them. So um, Mary was, and oh, by the way, it wasn't just Mary. St. Faustina is told by our Lord in the Diary of Divine Mercy that she is trans-consecrated. If you want to find this expression, it's found in entry 137. She relates, suddenly when I consented to the sacrifice with all my heart and all my will, God's presence pervaded me. My soul became immersed in God and was inundated with such happiness that I cannot put in writing even the smallest part of it. I was extraordinarily fused in God. A great mystery took place, a mystery between the Lord and myself. At that moment, I felt trans-consecrated. My earthly body was the same, but my soul was different. God was now living in it with the totality of his delight. Okay? So Mary, in the sense, was transubstantiated in God. Remember, these sacraments are a means to an end. They're not an end in themselves. Even St. Paul says, even Jesus says, and even the Catechism says, when Christ returns, the sacraments will be done away with. Why? Because Christ contains them all, and we will all be in Christ, in his mystical body, of which he is the head. So the sacraments lead us into the divine will. Once we are living in the divine will, we are living in that state of trans-consecration, transubstantiation. We are living hosts. This is why Jesus refers to Faustina as a living host, Louise as a living host, Vera Greed has a living host, a living tabernacle, and others, even Padre Pio as a living host. Mother Teresa of Calcutta speaks of living host, of herself being a living host. All these came after Louisa, you know, all these saints that speak of this new presence of the Trinity dwelling and operating among fully. And 
we still have to receive communion like Mary did, right? <laughs> now, she received it. We don't talk about this, do we? She received communion often. Mary, holy sacrament of communion from the Apostle John. <laughs> when she lived with him and when she left in Ephesus after the persecution, she was a communicant. <laughs> because wow. like Jesus tells Louisa, the more you receive me, the more it increases the presence of my divine will in you. Even though you're living in a complete stage, the degrees are endless. Okay. Next Father, question. oh, sorry. Yeah. I asked yep. that question, right? So I should have probably put more because it's, it's a quote from St. Maximilian Kolbe, right? Who lived in the divine will, right? And he talks about transubstantiation into Mary. And that was his grace court grace like in living in the divine will so sort yes. of yeah what if you knew about that so yeah <clears throat> yeah same maximum kobe talks about this and so does faustina i'll go on to maximum in a moment i'll share with you a passage from faustina of 1564 she says i am a white host before you O divine priest consecrate me yourself and may my transubstantiation be known only to you. St. Faustina, entry 1564. Now, if Faustina speaks of a transubstantiation of Christ in her soul, she's not speaking as a theologian, okay? In the Thomistic sense, the word transubstantiation came from a French bishop from the 12th century. Thomas Aquinas adopted it from this 11th century bishop, and he implies in his teaching on transubstantiation, that the replacement of one reality with the other occurs, okay? That the at the consecration, Christ replaces the reality or substance of the bread and with the reality of his own divine person in nature, okay? Christ's presence in the substance of the bread and of the wine is referred to in theology as his real presence. Faustina suggests rather, and so does Maximilian Kovi here, that God's full and incomprehensible possession of the human's intellect, memory, and will is such that they no longer operate apart from God's one eternal intellect, memory, and will. In this eternal act or eternal mode, Christ continuously extends his divine and eternal powers to the soul, that they may act in it fully and in such a mysterious way that the human mind cannot completely grasp it because the soul's powers are completely captivated by God and the only reality that can be used to shed light on it is the Eucharist as an analogy, okay? So when Maximilian Colby speaks about it, this is what he's referring to as well. He also you use as an expression, the assumption of the soul in love, okay? So yeah, this is not unusual for the saints to use this because they experience this. Like I said earlier, the same exact presence of Christ in the Eucharist is present in the soul, there's no difference the soul that lives in his will fully. It's the same presence. The church calls the Eucharist the real presence. Jesus calls his triune presence in the soul real life. The same as the blessed in heaven who enjoy the beatific vision and enjoy all the sacraments that are in Christ because they're in Christ, these souls. Okay, time to take a break. Okay, okay Father, okay, so what time are we starting again? Three right, we went a little past the hour. We've been on for all, over an hour this time. So we'll take a break till quarter past the hour. Okay. This meeting is being recorded. In the name of the Father, and of his Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us enter into the mystery of our Lord's passion in this holy week. Jesus today begins his passion in the late hours of the night when he leaves his mother at 5 p.m. and begins this vigil. We celebrate this normally Good Friday, we can begin even tonight to start to prepare ourselves for this passion that the Lord had already conceived in his heart on the moment he was conceived in Mary. 
And he asks Faustina that all those who recite this chaplet of divine mercy should enter within my passion in this holy hour when he died on the cross, because it is in this hour that the divine mercy is unleashed upon mankind. So much so that he has promised whatever you ask in my name will be granted to you in this hour, provided it's in accord with my will. So there's a connection between our prayers and his passion. What prayers we ask to be answered must be accompanied by meditation on his passion. With that in mind, let us pause for a moment, a moment and place whatever intentions we offer this chaplet up for. I wish to add a personal intention, and that is for peace on earth, for God's will to reign through us on earth, and that leaders of nations, including the United States, may be inspired to promote laws that are grounded upon the gospel ethic, that respect life from natural conception to natural death, that respect the dignity of the sacrament of matrimony, and that promote the due reverence and respect for all religions. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, was born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit in the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting, amen. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body and blood, soul and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body and blood, soul and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. 
for the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body and blood, soul and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body and blood, soul and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Eternal Father, I offer thee the body and blood, soul and divinity of thy dearly beloved Son, our Lord and Jesus Christ in atonement for our sins and those of the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. For the sake of his sorrowful passion, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. Holy God, Holy Mighty One, Holy Immortal One, have mercy on us and on the whole world. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Father, you're going to say, um, my husband is trying to understand this thing called the divine will. To him, it sounds like it's a separate thing like in the bible it talks about doing god's will 
And when I talk to him about living in God's divine will, it's like an added on thing. And um, he doesn't understand why he can't just do the will of God and do all of his prayers um, like we've been taught for the last 2,000 years. Um, how, how is it, why does he have to live in the divine will? And it's, what, you want to just help me with that question? Is there anything you want to add to it? Because I'm quite getting, he doesn't right. get that divine will. It's spoken as if it's a separate thing from God. My understanding is it's the essence of God. It's the operating power within the Trinity, but, and it's infinite and eternal. And you can affect things past, present, and future. But I, I can't explain it to him. Maybe I don't even I don't even understand it properly myself. So I'm just please, will good you question. just help us? Sure, that's a good question. Remember the God. Let's first of all talk about God. God is incomprehensible to the human mind, and this is clear in all of the church's conciliar documents. God, first of all, is eternal. We cannot understand what eternity is. We cannot. You cannot use an analogy for eternity. You cannot use a metaphor, a simile, an example. You can't. Because there's nothing in our experience in this universe that's eternal to compare it with. So eternity is incomprehensible to the created finite mind, number one. When God reveals himself, as he did to the apostles, he communicated to them little by little what it was like before original sin. So the purpose of God's revealing himself through Christ to the apostles was why? Ask yourself that question. Why did God reveal himself to the apostles? Why could not God just have revealed himself to Moses and that's good enough? Why? Because God does not reveal everything at once. God could have stopped with the Ten Commandments and that would have been it. He waited 2,000 years to give us the Ten Commandments. He waited another 2,000 years to give us Jesus Christ, the new law. Jesus appeared at the Transfiguration event beside two mysterious personages, Elijah and Moses. Why? To tell us that the law will never die represented in Moses and prophecy will never die represented in Elijah. These are the two foundations of the church that will never be done away with. So revelation is ongoing. That's why God did not stop with Moses to reveal to us his knowledge Ten commandments. After another 2000 years, he waited and revealed to us a higher level of those commandments called the new law, Christ. Now we waited another 2,000 years to give us an even higher law. Revelation never ends. Now certainly, the revelation of Christ and the apostles is what is referred to the church's councils as the public revelation, one public revelation of Christ. Nothing can be added to it, and nothing can be done to improve it. This is one revelation, foundation of our faith, that all future post-biblical revelations must refer to to determine their veracity, authenticity, or lack thereof. So if someone says to you, God told me this, you compare it with what? Scripture. Christ's revelation to the apostles. That's the normative expression of our faith. But scripture doesn't just contain the revelation of Christ to the apostles. It also contains all the revelation of the prophets of the Old Testament too. So that's the normative expression of our faith. All of scripture, not just the gospel. Okay, but the revelation doesn't end there. It's constituted with Christ. That means the foundation is set for all future times. So if someone comes giving a revelation to Faustina, to Louisa, to Margaret Mary Alacoque, 
to Our Lady of Fatima, to the shepherd children. These must not contradict the revelation contained in scripture or the church's tradition. The tradition of the church are those writings of the early fathers from the first to the sixth century that expound upon scripture and what was not written, but also orally transmitted by the apostles. St. John in his last gospel states, if everything Christ taught was written down, which it isn't, there would not be enough libraries in the world to contain all the books containing these teachings. Meaning that Christ didn't, the apostle didn't write everything down that Christ taught. That's why the fathers wrote these things down that the apostles did. This is part of the church's tradition. And the Second Vatican Council calls this a living tradition, not dead. It's ongoing with continued revelation, post-biblical revelations. So with that in mind, when we come to the writings of Louisa, we see it's not something that came detached from Christ or God. It's part of a pattern. God reveals himself every 2,000 years with Moses, with Jesus Christ, and now with the outpouring of the Spirit through the writings of Louisa Picaretta, Faustina Kowalska, Our Lady of Fatima, other apparitions of Mary. These are all part of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, true life and God messages that have the two imprimators and the two nihil of stats, talking about these end times. So revelation is an ongoing action. It's not something that is put away in a drawer. Now, with regard to your other question, in addition to it not being detached from the church, it's not. Article 66, I refer you to Article 66 of the Catholic Catechism. It has two sentences. Somebody's going to have to mute themselves again. Maybe you'll have to do that, Karen. Isn't it the same way you're doing the other thing, do you think? Um, okay. Um, um, okay. Okay. So Article 66 of the Catechism, the first sentence, I'll paraphrase, but let's go something like this. No new public revelation is to be expected before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me repeat that. No new public, the key word is public. No new public revelation is to be expected before the glorious manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ. The second sentence states, even though revelation in Christ is complete, it is not yet completed. There's a difference between complete and completed. It remains for the centuries for this revelation, for the faithful to fully explicate, that's the word he uses, the public, the revelation of Christ. Christ's revelation is not fully explicated. That's what it says. Even though the revelation is complete, it is complete. It is not fully explicated. That's the word. I said completed. Depending on the translation you have, the proper Latin word is explicated. So the second sentence should actually read, even though revelation in Christ is complete, it is not yet fully explicated. It remains for the course of the centuries to fully explicate, understand, um, grasp the full meaning of this revelation. What does this mean? It's not double talk. It's sort of like an oak tree in an, in an acorn. <clears throat> in the acorn is the oak tree. You don't see it because the water, the sun, and the soil have not yet penetrated it. Once they have, then it breaks open the seed burgeons. It produces a shoot, a bark, branches, leaves, grows, spreads its wings, its, its limbs. But that's how revelation works. God is, Jesus used the simile of a sea to represent revelation. The word of God is like a sea. Okay? And that's exactly what the word of God is like. Jesus says in John chapter 16, verse 12, telling the apostles days before he died, I had many things to tell you, but you are not yet ready to receive them. 
So I will send another in my name, the paraclete, the spirit, who will remind you of things I've said and reveal to you all the truth. Well, if Christ revealed all the truth, why would he have to send the spirit to reveal all the truth? That means that all the truth was revealed explicitly at the time of Christ. It wasn't. If it was, we wouldn't need these devotions like reparation to the sacred heart. We wouldn't need the feast of divine mercy. We wouldn't need the gift of living in the divine world. All these came after Christ's revelation to explicate that one unchanging deposit of faith to which nothing can be added or improved. Let me give you another analogy how this works. Suppose I have, suppose I do have. Oh, I bought this for Mary, by the way, a couple of days ago. Represents the lily, the purity of Mary, St. Joseph. Let this be the public revelation of Christ, the deposit of faith. That's the foundation of all revelation. Normatively, normatively expressed in scripture and also transmitted through tradition and magisterial teaching. This is all you see is all you get. Doesn't change, doesn't grow, nothing can be added to it. However, I'm looking at it with my bad vision. I'm gonna to try to look at it a little more closely. What is this? This is prophetic private revelation, the eyeglasses. So now I can see the gift of living in the divine world is right here. It's in Jesus Christ. It's in Mary. It's in Adam. It's in Eve down here. Here it's in Mary. Here it's in Jesus. But without these, I can't see it because it has not been brought to clarity to my impaired vision. The lenses are Louise's revelations. This is Christ's revelation. See how they work? This doesn't add anything to the plant, to the flower, kind of both. Uh, what do you call it? A lily plant, lily flower. But my eyes see that which was always there in Christ, in Adam, in Eve, in Mary, but that has not yet been revealed to my impaired vision. But it's always been there. So the gift of the divine will is not something that's new. It's something that has always been in tradition and scripture, but has been dormant, latent, not explicated. The Holy Spirit is saying here to everybody, take these glasses. Now I want you to see what is now being poured out. So the Holy Spirit is doing two things. It's revealing through these lenses a new clarity to what went on in Adam and even Jesus Christ in their souls, where they were impacting all creation. And on the other hand, it's actualizing it in us. This is new. It's not new in the sense that it was already in Adam and Eve, Jesus and Mary. Because of sin, it was suspended. But now in these end times, God's revealing himself again every 2,000 years. He's now saying it's being, being actualized in us. Okay? This is how it's part of the church. It's not detached from the church. It's one homogenous development from the beginnings of the creation of Adam through Moses, through Jesus, through Mary, through Louisa. So hopefully that answers in part some of your question. Yes, it does. Thank you, Father. That was a beautiful explanation, Father. Sure. Um, do you want to answer another question or do you want to go ahead? There's... Yeah, we can take some questions while we're on the theme. Yeah. Doesn't the teaching of being judged by one's own individual conscience and the openness to religious practices outside the church's liturgy have a reverse effect if Eastern forms of meditation or yoga, etc., offered even at many parishes worldwide are used by Catholics as a substitute for the mass and prayer, especially by the many poorly catechized? No, the simple answer is no. Remember, Jesus gave us as a foundation for discerning right and wrong our conscience, not as the ultimate guide, as a foundation. That's a, that's a rudimentary tool. Before we are given the knowledge of the fullness of the truth, which takes a long time to understand. And it's a lifelong experience. We're still learning more and more about God as we, as we age. And even in heaven, they continue to grow little by little in glory through the knowledge of God. So this 
teaching of one's conscience is found right in the church's documents, okay? We all are given this likeness and image of God whereby we know without any formal instruction to discern in general terms right from wrong. Certainly there's a danger once we say that your individual conscience suffices. That's not what I said. I never said your individual conscience suffices. What I said was reading from the Julman Gentium article 16, that do those due to no fault of their own, that's the part you might have missed. Think of those words carefully. Due to no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, who are these people due to no fault of their own? Suppose you were born in a country and in a village there that knew nothing about Christ nor the gospel, and you were raised by nice, respectful parents, and they educate you in their shaman religion, or their Pachimama religion, or their Taoist religion, or their Buddhist religion, or their Muslim religion, or whatever religion. That's not Christian. Is it a sin for you to obey your parents' religion? No. Doesn't the Bible say, honor your father and mother? Well, then you must honor their religion, right? You don't know any better, you're just a child. And a child is expected by God to obey its parents. Doesn't know any better. So you grow up in that country. You didn't decide to be born there. You didn't decide what religion your parents would embrace. And out of respect, you grow up with that religion. That's a virtue. There's no sin in that. You're respecting your parents and what they believe in. Now, as you get older, you attain the age of reason, depending upon you know, your, 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 um, your propensity and all that. Some say it's the age of like six, seven, eight, whatever. And then you begin to reason for yourself. And as you continue to grow and mature and then attain adulthood, you choose things on your own. You do your own research. You want to get to the bottom of things. Find out if this is just created by man or by God. These truths that you were taught as a child. This is where you now take on more responsibility to decide for yourself the eternal fate of your own soul. Now your parents are not responsible anymore. You are. Okay? So it changes. The, it shifts the, the, the degree of responsibility as you mature. Okay, so those individuals who never are exposed to the gospel of Christ and go by this law of their conscience, due to no fault of their own, God will not deny them salvation provided they follow these dictates of their conscience, which is doing good and avoiding evil. Basically the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Or as the Italian rule, do unto others before they do unto you. No, you don't want to follow that one. And I'm sorry to put the Italians down all the time. I'm Italian. I like to joke about the Italians you know, because they have a good sense of humor. But the truth is that God said in scripture through Jesus Christ, those who knew the Father's will but did not do it will be beaten with more stripes than those who did not know the Father's will and did not do it. See what I mean? To those, those to whom much is given, much is demanded. Those to whom less is given, less is demanded. We Catholics, Orthodox Christians who have either the sacraments or the faith or baptism or the faith in Christ have been given more than those who have not from a Christian perspective. So more will be demanded of us than those who do not know Jesus Christ. That's obvious. So that is the context of that teaching of Lumen Gens. Hope that answers your question. Someone who's asking, Jesus, Mary, and Louisa conceived the lives and acts of all creation in the divine will. Can you explain this and how do we live in this divine will? Um, I don't have the question in front of me. So he's saying Jesus... Mary and Louisa conceived all the acts of all the creatures in the divine will, and how can we do that? Conceive the lives and acts of all creatures in the divine will. Can you explain this and how do we live in this divine in live this in divine will? 
Sorry. Sure. Well, Jesus, yeah. Now, they didn't all do it at the same time or in the same manner. Jesus, when he became incarnate in the, word, in the womb of Mary, conceived all the lives of all souls in her womb. This is revealed to Louisa, if you'd like to know, in volume 17 on May 1st, 1925. He reveals it behooves you to know that just as my humanity in its office of redeemer conceived all souls, so you must do the same in your mission and office to make my will known and reign. As you continue to accomplish your acts in my will on behalf of all creatures, all will remain conceived in your will. Remember, the will is the most important faculty in which are deposited all the acts of all creatures that we assimilate our acts with in God's one eternal act that embraces all time. And as you keep repeating your acts in mine, you receive many infusions of the life of my divine will that nourish all creatures who by virtue of my will remain conceived in your will. In my will, you embrace everyone from the first to the last creature that is to exist on earth. And on behalf of all, you thereby offer satisfaction, love, and glory to my supreme will. Now, Jesus also reveals that um, when he was conceived in his mother's womb, he conceived all the lives of all humans as well. So this is how it's done by doing our acts, assimilating them with all creatures. And um, let's see here. This is another passage I want to share with you, what I'm referring to about Christ. This comes from um, day three of the Novena for Christmas, which is known as the Nine Excesses of Love. Jesus, as an infant in the womb of Mary, is speaking, and he says, Compelled as I was by the divine flames of my eternal love, do you know what it is that I set ablaze? Ah, I set ablaze souls. I was satisfied only after I conceived all souls within me at the moment of my conception and enveloped them in my divine flames of love. So while he conceived all souls at the moment he was conceived, because he's God, his, his will did not need to be expanded in his divinity. It contained the whole universe's soul, but his humanity did. So he conceived all souls immediately when he was born in his human nature. And then throughout the course of his actions in his human nature, motivated by his divine will, he sanctified all souls, he perfected all souls. He imparted to them merit. I'll share another passage here with you. And this comes from volume 11, August 14th, 1912. He reveals, when I was on earth, did my hands not lower themselves to work the wood, hammer the nails, help my putative father Joseph? While I was doing this with my own hands and fingers, I created souls. He means call them back to him transform them while calling back others to life. I divinized and sanctified all human activity, imparting divine merit to each human action. In the movement of my fingers, I called into sequence all the movements of your fingers and those of others, imparting to them the merit of my own life. By lowering myself to all of these little and lowly actions that men do in their daily lives, such as eating, sleeping, drinking, working, and all the actions that are indispensable to all humans, I throughout all human actions, sorry, I formed a small divine little coin of incalculable value and made it flow throughout all human actions. So if my passion redeemed man, my hidden life provided each human action, even the most insignificant, with divine merit of infinite value. So Jesus conceived all souls at the moment he was conceived in the womb of Mary. Oh, it's snowing outside <laughs> again. And he sanctified all human activity throughout his actions. He tells Louisa to do the same. She didn't conceive them when all souls when she was conceived, 
like Jesus did, but she was asked to conceive and sanctify them simultaneously with all of her actions throughout creation. I'm going to share with you uh, this beautiful little snowfall here. It's coming down. Yeah, welcome to the Hermitage. <laughs> okay. How is it possible that the Virgin Mary did not enjoy the beatific vision while she was on earth when she told Louisa that she would often take body and soul into heaven and she would prostrate before the Holy Trinity and smiled at them? Before you yeah, go, on, go ahead. Before you go on, I just want you to know that people love this because it's like gathering around their father asking questions and having this oh. beautiful time back and forth. Well, thank you. I'm very, I'm very pleased to do what I'm ordained to do. I hadn't, when I gave my fiat to God, it was unconditional. And I didn't realize I'd be born in the end times. And that it's a, it's a blessing and a curse because it's the greatest outpouring of evil and the grace of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit. As St. Paul says, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. And God has saved his best wine for last. Now is the time for the greatest gift ever reserved for the uh, for mankind, the gift of living in the divine will. And it's a pleasure for me to share because I really draw satisfaction and grow in knowledge from these questions as well. And um, it's a humbling experience to me to know that God can write straight on uh, such a crooked line as me. <laughs> so that's a good thing. Um, in answer to that question, um, the Blessed Mother, remember the beatific vision imparts impeccability, immortality, um, impassibility, and infused knowledge. Mary did not have all of these qualities. She had to die. Some people say, no, Mary didn't die. Well, I would refer these people to a church document penned by Pope Pius XII, entitled Munificentissimus Deus the most magnificent God, in which more no less than four times, I think it's article 17, 27, 34, he refers to Mary as having died, like our Lord, that's right. Yes, the Eastern liturgy refers to it as a dormition, and rightly so, because her death was not like our death, but it was still a death. She still physically lost her vital faculties for three days like our Lord, before being assumed, not ascended, Remember, Christ by his own power ascends. Mary passively by Christ's power is assumed by the power of God into heaven after three days. And her body was incorrupt during those three days, like Christ's, whereas we start to corrupt right away. So her death was dissimilar to ours, but it was still a physical death. And um, she was not immortal there, for which the beatific vision imparts. And she did not have infused knowledge like the angels and saints do in that degree, because remember, she couldn't find our Lord for three days, and she couldn't see all the ends of things that happened, unless God revealed them to her, which sometimes he did, but not all the time, some infusions of knowledge she had. What you're referring to are these transports that she experienced in the book entitled The Blessed Virgin Mary in the Kingdom of the Divine Will book, principally for the month of May, but it can be recited any month, are 36 lessons of Our Lady that correspond to the 36 volumes of our Lord on how to live in the divine. Will that begin with her in the womb of that? And before her body was formed, her soul at the moment of conception was bilocating from the womb of Anne to the Trinity, back to the womb of Anne, back to the Trinity. But this is not the beatific vision. She's still on earth, remember, but bilocating. When you bilocate, you don't leave her. You remain on earth and you multi-locate. When Jesus came into the Eucharist, he didn't leave heaven. He didn't leave the Father and the Spirit. He was always in heaven, even when he incarnated himself in the womb of Mary. He never left heaven. He bilocated. And the same thing with the Eucharist. He bilocated. And then the same thing with, as happens with us. When the Trinity comes into us, they bilocate in us while remaining in heaven. Same with the Blessed Mother. When she appears at Fatima, she didn't leave heaven. She bilocates her presence. And this is something that we can fully comprehend, how a person can be talking now and still appear somewhere and talk to another person at the same time. Padre Pio had this gift. St. Anthony of Padua had this gift. St. Alphonse de Liguori had this gift of physical bilocation. 
with this gift Mary is speaking about, it's a spiritual bilocation. Her soul, not her body, is bilocating before the Trinity and back within her body in the womb of Anne. So I hope that explains in part how she had this supernatural infusion of knowledge that we don't have, but it was not quite the beatific vision. Yes, Father, thank you so much. You're that was great, great explanation. Thank you so much. So when Jesus bilocated, um, he did bring heaven with him, right? Yes. And that's why he said heaven is at hand. Okay. Yeah, and he said the kingdom of God is among you. <laughs> yeah. Where can we find the official approval of the church for all of Louise's writings to share with priests? Please, please, or can Father Aganuzi provide us with a copy on his website? Yeah, on my website, I will refer you to my dissertation that has the official pontifical approval of the University of Rome, which is authorized by the Vatican, authorized by the Holy See. The pontifical university is authorized by the Holy See to give it these academic seals of approval. So it has that seal on it and it contains a condensed version of all 36 volumes. What do I mean by this? While we are awaiting for all 36 to be officially sealed, I have already provided a condensed version of all 36. Why condensed? Because Louisa was not a scholar, a theologian, or an author. She did not write with any system or method. It was scattered and uncoordinated. She would write on any theme at any moment Whenever Jesus spoke to her, sometimes she didn't write for days, weeks, because of illnesses, sufferings, and then she would recollect it all in not in the proper order. In fact, volume one was written long after the first volume, or after volume two and three. So she had written this later, and she therefore she didn't put any dates to this first several like hundred pages because she didn't remember the dates. So what I did in my dissertation is extrapolate all those new teachings of Christ on his divine will that are contained, contained in our 15,000 plus pages and reduce them into just over 400 pages and footnotes. Why 400? Because she repeated the things hundreds of times. She repeated things a lot and Christ repeated them a lot to her so that it would sink into her. Like a child with a parent. If you explain the Eucharist to a child, one time is not gonna do it. You explain it once, then you explain it again. And again, it may take you 20 times. This is how Jesus taught Louisa. So you can literally, if you were to remove all repetitions of teachings from her writings, reduce over 15,000 into just under a thousand pages. <laughs> but the reason for that repetition is because it gives us different angles, different perspectives, different analogies, different uh, situations that we can more easily understand the reality through. So we need to, uh, under, <coughs> she needed to understand all this very clearly. So in my dissertation, I translated from the original Italian text that I have access to that were given to me by two commissioners from the Archdiocese of Trani. And they testified in my dissertation that my English translations are authentic to the original Italian, Father Bucci and Father Martin. Um, all of these writings into 400 pages, but I did it in a systematic style. I started, I took all the references of Louisa to creation and put them in chapter after her life. I, chapter one is a biography. Okay. Then I start with chapter two, creation, chapter three, redemption, chapter four, sanctification. Then I compare it with the Eastern Fathers, chapter five, the Scholastic Fathers, chapter six, chapter seven, the resourcement theologians. And I show that there's no discrepancy in her writings with 2,000 years of Christian theology, East and West. So in my thesis, I provide a system for the first time to all of her theology. So this has been the first time it's been done. And it's not been done since actually. There's a systematic approach to her theology. So I have to go through all of her writings and systematic, systematically extrapolate every reference to Adam and Eve and put them in chronological order. When he was created, when he thanked God, when he spoke, when he met Eve, when he sinned, when the, when the Satan approached Eve, then when he, Eve sinned, he sinned, he fell. In that order, I had to provide this theology in Louisa's writings. So I had to take them out of her volumes and put them in the right order. And I did this with all creation, redemption, sanctification, fiats. So that's why I would refer you to that dissertation because it's a systematic 
though a bit academic, approach to her writings. Number two, I would also refer you to the Splendor of Creation work, which is endorsed by two bishops. That's also on that same website. That gives you a um, recapitulation of salvation history. Um, and all of this outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that's the fruit of really 6,000 years of revelation. And there's also a short free download manual on how to instruct people on the gift of the divine will, just 11 pages. That's on the website as well. Um, but right now, if you want to read the volumes, there are about five different versions in circulation in English. They all contain some mistakes, but you could read either version you prefer. And if you come across something you find is unusual, you could always address it in one of my Zooms with a great Q&A. Very good. Next question. Do we conceive the lives and acts of creatures in our acts? Yeah, we do it like Louisa did, Mary did Jesus did. We don't conceive it at conception like Jesus, but we conceive it nevertheless, their lives and their actions. Because remember, the purpose of doing this is to restore to the Father the glory that was lost and that was due him by a third of the creation that fell with the angel, Lucifer, and by souls that are damned, that turn away from God's grace. That's the whole purpose of doing this, to provide God with the glory that he is now being deprived of. And God, who knows all things, knows that he will have that number of elect to provide him with this. We don't know their number, he knows, and he knows who they are. And Jesus tells Louisa, every soul that is created has an obligation to love me constantly. And for those moments when it did not love me constantly, it will have to go to purgatory to fill in these gaps when it failed to love, love me. Mm -hmm. He says, however, the soul can redouble its love on earth and fill in these gaps so that it doesn't go to purgatory. And um, he explains to her how the soul redoubles its love. And the reason I mention this is because um, this is our mission on earth to give God all the glory, not just we owe him every moment of our lives, but in the divine will, all other creatures owe him. And this is how we form a kingdom within our soul of all the acts of love, praise, worship, thanksgiving, even reparation to God for the sins of others on behalf of those who fail to give him these acts, okay? Um, so uh, another way of, we want, you wanna know the shortcut to redoubling all the love and filling in all the voids in your soul. <coughs> There's a shortcut. Yeah. Remember, Adam has to fill in all these voids in his soul with divine acts that engender light within these voids, illuminating them and overflowing onto his body. There is a shortcut where you could fill in these voids in one day and go straight to heaven if you in, on that day if you should die that day. It is called the Feast of Divine Mercy. On that day, the floodgates are open to all mankind, no matter how many sins you may have committed, no, how many, no matter how many voids filled with the lack of love that you may have accrued throughout your lifetime. On the Feast of Divine Mercy, not only is the sin taken away, but the punishment. What does that mean? all the voids are filled in. That means if you die that day, there's nothing to keep you from going straight to heaven. No one can go to heaven without filling these voids. Jesus tells this to Louisa. But on the Feast of Mercy, they're all filled in. This happens once a year. And this is why I consider it in my personal experience, the greatest feast personally, not liturgically, in the entire church. It's the Feast of Divine Mercy because that's the day when all the voids of your soul are filled. And then throughout life, when you start making mistakes, you have to make up for them again and start cutting people off driving in traffic. And there's another void. And you know how it works. <laughs> yeah. But Father, what do you think about this? Um, if you, in an act of love to God and an act of our neighbors that don't have an intellect, um, having the desire for them, 
the will to have the desire for them to get to heaven, the desire for them to have baptism. I'm talking about the cells that were fertilized, the cell lines that are fertilized and are being destroyed now without any sacramental uh, uh, sacrament, a baptism for us to love them and adopt them because they don't have parents that will do that for them. Would that be acceptable to God? Yeah. Let's all do that, think, everybody. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah, Go there's on. a lot of frozen, frozen life out there, frozen embryos. Thank you. Yes. Um, is it okay to read Louisa's writings through a Divine Will app? Someone mentioned earlier that there is an app. Someone else mentioned it is wrong to read her writings through an internet app. Yeah, there's a bit of confusion here, and there's been a change of the guard also in the Archdiocese of Corrado. There have been three different bishops that have created and modified certain restrictions, including at one point, Carmelo Casati, who the late Archbishop Carmelo Casati, who opened up a cause for beatification, put for a while in the late 90s a moratorium on conferences on account of certain promoters unauthorized by the church that were associating Louise's writings with teachings that were not consistent with church doctrine. They were doing this to their own unawares because they were not theologians. So they were preaching mistakes, not knowing they were mistakes, saying this is what Louisa said, but that's not what Louisa was saying. So more, so bishops wrote the Vatican saying this has got to stop. So Archbishop Casati intervened and put a moratorium for a few years on conferences. Then that was lifted. Okay. Then Archbishop Picchieri allowed people to read whatever is in, in circulation out there, but not to start printing and making a business out of printing and disseminating Louise's writings because all of these writings, which are not properly translated in English, they don't have the proper theological syntax or language or terminology. Some of the words, I've read all of these five volumes, not every word of every five volume, but I've, I've, I've read through all five and all five of them have errors. And all five of them use a very street language, which you can't use in theology. They don't express properly the concept Louise is trying to express in theology. So they have to be refined. But Archbishop Picchieri said, still, you can read them. There's nothing wrong with that. Read what's in circulation, but just don't start printing them and disseminating them because then you make a market of these writings that are not properly done and that creates confusion when the good ones come out. So I understand his point. So on the one hand, you don't want to deprive them of the writings that are in circulation. And on the other hand, you don't want to tell them, don't wait, you don't want to tell them to wait until the official volumes come out, because who knows when they'll come out. And for the past 10 years, I heard people saying, they're coming out next year, they're coming out next year. I told them, don't just don't listen. Only the Holy Spirit knows that answer, not even we do. So what we do is we avail ourselves of the time that is at our disposal, that's it. All we have is today. We could die tomorrow for all we know. So we avail ourselves of the time today. Jesus said this, let today's worries be sufficient for today. So what's available today, make use of and know that they're not the perfect translations. And if you come across something that's unusual, then you can uh, consult with a theologian. I, like I said, any priest is, you can consult with two who knows their, the, who knows his theology, did I say her? <laughs> who knows his theology properly? <laughs> Don't stone me, that was a slip of the tongue. I'm thinking of the soul, you know, the soul is <laughs> Um, So yeah, that's the idea, you know. Um, no, we should not start marketing them. That's not a good idea. Yeah. When we offer the acts of creatures to God in divine will, it includes an angel's acts and other rational creatures in the universe? Yes. Okay. We My question. Ourselves. My question refers to when she was a newborn baby. Oh, I don't know what that is. Okay, would you give us an example of prayer, fusing yourself in God and asking his fusing himself in you and all souls? Would I give an example of fusing ourselves in God? An example of a, prayer, of a prayer? Fusing yourself in 
Would you give yourself an example of a prayer fusing yourself in God and asking for his fusing himself in you and all souls? Um, I can, I'm thinking of in Louisa's writings where she does this. Yeah, I'll give you an example of how Louisa does this. And she does all the above that you're asking. And this is found um, in volume 12, May 16th, 1919. <coughs> it's not in a few volumes. I'll start here. She, she reveals um, I try to fuse myself in Jesus, in his will, multiplying my thoughts in his in order to make reparation and to substitute for all created intelligences of the past, present, and future. Let me repeat that. I try to fuse myself in my Jesus, in his will, multiplying my thoughts in his, in order to make reparation, to substitute for all the created intelligences of the past, present, and future. And from the heart, I said to my Jesus, how I wish to give you with my mind complete glory, honor, and reparation for the entire human race, even for the lost souls who did not offer such acts to you for with their own intelligence. And he being pleased, kissed me on my forehead saying, and I seal with my kiss all of your thoughts with mine, so that I may always find in you all created minds and receive continuous glory, honor, and reparation in their name. Another passage is taken from volume 17, May 17, 1925. This is how Louisa would daily fuse herself. As the immense void presents itself before my mind. What is this immense void? Nothingness. She empties herself of everything. I fuse myself in that supreme will. She enters in with, within her own nothingness. Remember how we begin our prayer? I am nothing, God is all, come divine. She enters into this void, this nothingness of herself and fuses herself in the supreme will. And as the little child, I begin my round again and rising up on high, I desire to requite my God for all the love he offered all creatures at the moment of their creation. I want to honor him as the creator of all things. And so going around the stars and in each glimmer of light, I impress my, I love you and glory to my creator. And every atom of sunlight that descends again, I impress my I love you and glory throughout the entire expanses of the heavens and the distance from one step to another. I impress my I love you in glory and the warbling of the birds and the fluttering of their wings. I impress love and glory to my creator and the blade of grass that sprouts from the earth and the flower that blooms in the fragrance that ascends, I impress my love and glory on the mountain peaks and in the depths of the valleys, I impress love and glory. I wander throughout the hearts of every creature and wanting to enclose myself within each heart. And with, from within them, I cry out, I love you and glory to my creator. Then as if I had united every act, in such a way that everything returns love and glory to God for everything he did in creation, I go to his throne and say, Supreme Majesty and creator of all things, this little child comes into your arms in the name of all creatures to tell you that all creation gives you not only a return of love, but also the just glory for the so many things you created for love of us. In your will is this immense empty space. Everywhere I journeyed. In your will, in this immense empty space, everywhere I journeyed, so that all things may glorify you, love you, and bless you. And now that I have rejoined the bonds of love between you, our creator, and all creatures that the human will had broken, 
as well as restituted the glory that everyone owed you, let your will descend to earth, that it may bind and strengthen all bonds between you, our creator, and all creatures, so that all things may return to their original order, the order you had established in the beginning. Amen. Are you ready for the next one, Father? Yeah, we'll take another and then we'll take a little. Oh, I guess we'll just keep going. Yeah, we'll take another question. Why does Pope Francis say don't seek spiritual classes and uh, answers in, spir in yoga classes? I didn't hear that question. Can you repeat it? I'm sorry. Why does Pope Francis say don't seek spiritual answers in yoga classes? I would imagine because yoga does not provide Christianity as a source to answers for life. Yoga is based upon the Buddhist philosophy. Actually, it originated in Laos, uh, in Hinduism, and then it migrated to Buddhism. And Laos is where Hinduism, so a little country, he'll slip a slither above India, then it went to Japan. You know, Japan is like 5% Catholic. It's mostly Buddhist, 90 plus percent Buddhist. And yoga took root in Buddhism. And um, it's based on the yin yang. Um, well, no, no, that's the Chinese. It's based on the um, reincarnation theology, which is not true. Now, certainly you can divest yoga of all these incantations of the mantra and of these points in the, of the energy that come from the impersonal cosmos that are supposed to free you. Now there is good in recollecting oneself, in centering oneself in prayer and in God. Now remember, when we're speaking of yoga, I'm not condemning the people because again, the context is these people are raised in this culture, they're raised in this religion, so we have to respect that because they respect their parents who brought them up in it. But Christianity's mission, part of it is to enculturate the gospel in different cultures and in different uh, customs. So when the church had created a liturgy in Africa, as it did in other countries that were in, infiltrated with tribalism, it had to wean from its culture in its liturgy, this tribalism theology, in, insert Christ, introduce Christ and salvation history. There's no reincarnation and there's no um, impersonal force throughout the cosmos, it's God. In fact, St. John took a Greek word logos that was an impersonal force and applied it to Christ, making him the force of the universe, but a personal God. So I think what Francis is alluding to there is that the true answers that satisfy the longing of the human heart can come from yoga, you know? They can come from the truth. And there's only one truth that sets us free, as Jesus says. It's an eternal truth. Now, this one truth doesn't condemn everyone who's not part of the team, so to speak. This is not like a corporation. No, this is a communion. Anyone can create a community, which is a collection of bodies. You can do it. I can do it. The church can do it, too. We can have meetings, ad hoc meetings. We could have... Uh, full sessions, that's fine. But that doesn't mean there's communion. Communion it only comes from the Holy Spirit. You know when you have communion in a community? When you all have the same goal. That's when you have it. In many communities, corporations, even institutes, even within and without of the church, I've seen people with completely different goals, working in the same building, working in the same institute for different reasons and going in different directions. Communion is when you all have one goal. That's communion. That can only come from the Holy Spirit. You pray for it. You don't create it. It comes to you. How do you get it? You repent. You lower your head. And you um, entreat the Holy Spirit for unity. It won't come by you saying, no, I know how it's going to be done. Everybody step back. Uh, the boss is here. That's the opposite, 180 degree opposite approach to the Christian uh, uh, response to disunity. 
Uh, should I go on to another one or are you finished, Father? I think so. Okay. I'm not sure. Louisa baptized all newly born creatures who will emerge into the light of this day. My question, can we baptize our grandchildren plus great grandchildren at the time they were born like Louisa did because the, the parents have refused to have them baptized? That's a good question. And on my website, actually, I address this question. Um, uh, there's a Q&A section on my website and in it, there's the question of, did Louisa, when she implored our Lord to baptize all people, um, did she baptize them, in fact, you know, all people of all time? And the answer is not sacramentally. So um, I don't want, it may take a little while to go on the website and pull it up now. But Louisa was imploring that Jesus baptize all newborn infants in the divine will, that's what she was asking, baptizing them in the divine will. And the Lord answered her, he said, yes, I will do that for you. Now, what does this mean? That they're sacramentally baptized? No, because for um, baptism to be sacramental, two things are needed. And this applies to every sacrament, matter and form. What is the matter of baptism? Water. And what is the form? The invocation of the three names of the three divine persons. If you baptize and don't mention Father, Son, and Spirit, it's invalid. If you use Father, Son, and Spirit, but don't use water, it's invalid. You have to have both. What is the matter and form of communion? Bread and wine is the matter. The form, the consecratory words, the priest recites. What is the matter and form in commun confession? The matter is contrition. Okay. And the form are the words of absolution of the priest. And the list goes on for the sacraments. So they didn't, Louisa could not administer sacramental baptism because she had no water. She, that enough invalidates the sacramental baptism. This is like a baptism of desire. Remember I spoke of three types of baptism when quoting from, when citing Lumen Gentium. And there's the baptism of sacrament, baptism of blood, which is martyrdom and baptism of desire. Those who do due to no fault of their own, do not know the gospel of Christ yet seek salvation by living according to the dictates of their conscience by doing good and avoiding evil. This is the kind of baptism she was imploring on their behalf, that they all be brought to the knowledge of the divine will, all these people, so that they can receive this gift. And if they're, let's say, learned or unlearned, Christian or non-Christian, all people will not be excluded from this outpouring eventually. In other words, she's saying, ensure that they get to heaven somehow whether it's through the sacraments or through baptism of desire, because once you're in heaven, you're living in the divine will, right? <laughs> everyone in the divine will is, everyone in heaven is living in the divine will. They got the gift, but it's more meritorious to receive it on earth than in heaven, because as I quoted to you from the volume of Louisa earlier, those who live in it on earth, who enjoy the same interior union as enjoyed by the angels and saints in heaven, but with suffering and sacrifice and oftentimes without delight. And wherever there is sacrifice, God takes more delight. So he derives more glory and delight from the souls on earth who do his living as well and from those in heaven. What is more, he tells Louisa, that the glory that the angels and saints <coughs> enjoy in heaven is the result of the acts done on earth by the souls who live in his will. Okay, and uh, let me see if I could find that passage for you since I brought it up. <clears throat> I've been having this walking little cough since January the 1st of this year. 
Um, I have a post nasal drip sometimes when I sleep. Some of the, some it goes in my lungs. Mm. And uh, I broke my nose wrestling, you know, come more than once. And as a result, I had to have a work done and um, cut this part out of the, <laughs> of, the, of the sharing session if you can. But that's why I cough from time to time. It's a post nasal drip. <coughs> Um, Yeah, I'm trying to find a phrase that will pull it up more easily. <clears throat> I think I found it. This is found in volume seven, May 9th, 1907. Yes, volume seven, May 9th, 1907. All right, now let's, we can continue. Do our realms in the past alter the course of a person, nation, etc., in the present and the future? Can you, well, the first part was a little low in volume. Oh, sorry. Um, hold on. <clears throat> Do our rounds in the past alter the course of a person, nature, nation, etc., in the present and the future? Absolutely, but it won't um, alter their the particular judgment of which they are alone responsible for. So, for example, let's suppose they mention the present and the future, which is which is correct. We cannot alter the judgment pronounced upon souls in the past, the particular judgment. As the Council of Trent teaches, uh, the general judgment sentence at the end of the world will not vary from the judgment given at the particular judgment when the soul leaves the body. So everyone who's dead, we cannot alter their destiny. But what we can do is ransom the acts of those souls that are eternally lost, glorifying God on their behalf for the acts that they failed to do. But for the ones of the present and the future, yes, we can alter them for sure. Okay. Should we enclose all souls within us continually and keep them like mother, a mother feeding them with our acts? 24 seven. Okay. Now it's not always possible to be focused or have a detailed awareness of everything we're doing when we're doing it. God does not expect that. He does not have it to, uh, expect you to have before you all the time the souls of the first century, fourth century, 12th century, ninth century. No. You with a general fiat and a desire, and God allows you with one broad sweep to impact all things of all time with one breath, with one prayer. But the key is you have to be in the state of grace. You have to, with an upright intention, desire this gift. God's one eternal act operating you, the Father and the will, the Son and the intellect, the Spirit and the memory, and with a firm desire, live in it, never to leave it. Now, let's suppose you do leave it, you commit a sin. Well, then you confess, you go right back into this eternal circle in which there is no time. Yeah. Father, please explain in the Book of Heaven when Louisa prays, in the name of everyone and everything. Um, Please explain when she prayed or how she prayed. I guess explain about it. Please explain in the book of heaven when Lisa, uh, Louisa prays in the name of everyone and everything. I kind of did that already. When I did that 
answer the question about fusing oneself in the divine will. <clears throat> and if you didn't ca if you didn't hear that, I refer you again back to volume 17, May 17th, 1925. She said, an event, immense void presents itself before my mind. I fuse myself in God's will. And as a little child begin my rounds. And then she goes throughout all creation. She goes throughout the light, the sun, the moon, the trees, the stars, every human thought, every human word, every human action. And she assimilates herself with these by glorifying God on their behalf. How do you do that? <clears throat> Suppose you have a child that you love very much or a spouse that you love no less. And they're going in a wayward direction and you want to save them from their peril. What do you do? You turn to God on their behalf and you implore God on their behalf. God overlooked the sins of this child. What did Jesus do when his executioners were nailing him to the cross? He said, Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. That is how Louisa in the divine will was imploring on behalf of all souls. She was justifying them before the father, asking God to take mercy on them. And then she was also giving God at the same time the glory they were failing to give God. And this is how we do our rounds in the divine world. We use the same approach of Christ when he sort of uh, stood in on behalf of those who couldn't stand in for themselves. He took upon himself the sins we could not atone for. And that's what we do in the rounds. We, like Christ, become co-redeemers. We stand in for those who won't stand in for themselves, who are on a path to damnation. And then we also give God the glory for those, the acts that they failed to do by doing them on our behalf. We're by doing them on their behalf within our own humanity. Um, Father, someone made a suggestion. Uh, thank you, Father. Lemon and honey drink and saline nasal washes, but being a doctor, you already know this. Yeah, I thank you for reminding me. But being a man, I don't do what I'm asked to do. <laughs> <laughs> being a doctor, you're the worst patient. <laughs> <laughs> I know it, but I just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> because I, I've had this issue for 20 plus years. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, someone asked if there, uh, wait, anyway, we could view this Zoom meeting from the beginning. Yeah, we're making uh, a YouTube video. Um, a priest told me that we cannot give God glory and cannot hurt him without our sin, with our sin, because he is unaffected by what we do. He remains the same at peace always and does not react to our freely, freely willed behavior. He loves us, but doesn't have an, an emotional attachment to us. Would you agree or disagree? It confused me a little bit. Let me see if I can pull up the chat. That's kind of quite a long. Uh, okay. okay. We can, I see it. I see it. Yep. We cannot give God glory and cannot hurt him with our sin. Well, I don't know if the priest said exactly those words. If he did, that's not quite theologically correct. We can indeed hurt God. We can offend him. Why would Jesus come to Margaret Mary Alacoc and ask that reparation be done? Because he, he suffers. Now, there's a difference between suffering, sorrowing, and pain. Three different uh, words that we use to describe what the the passion of Christ, pain, sorrow, and suffering. Okay, three verbs. Now, <clears throat> um, I'll go into that in a moment. Let me finish the question. Because he is unaffected by what we do, that's not true. He remains the same at peace always and does not react to our physical behavior. He loves us, but doesn't have an emotional attachment to us. Oh, my ear blood fell out. By the way, I have a little bit of a cauliflower here, here from wrestling, so this doesn't stay in very well. So I'm, I'm, all, I'm all battered up from wrestling, falling apart by the seams. Okay, so it says, uh, I've been, would you agree or disagree? Okay, so let's break this down. 
in heaven, there's perfect bliss. There's perfect happiness. There's no weeping. That's what they say, right? No weeping, no more sorrow. But yet, if you read Revelation chapter 9, verse 6, I think that's the right passage. They're complaining in heaven. They're imploring that vengeance be exacted on their behalf, on, be, on behalf of the souls who were beheaded during the persecution of Christians. So they're saying, how long, Lord, will you wait to avenge our blood that was shed in the name of the Lamb? And God replies, not until the quota has been complete. So if in heaven they're all rejoicing and doing kumbayas and trust throws, how could they be complaining at the same time for their to be, blood to be avenged? Right? So you see, heaven is not just all this happy and love. It is because they're all doing the will of God. But God will reveal to some souls in heaven, depending <laughs> upon their rank, certain things that are going on. on okay, we have to again go to the mute button, Carol. <laughs> Um, Sono sempre gli italiani, it's always the Italians. <laughs> sempre gli italiani, mamma mia, ma stunada. <laughs> That's okay. I'm one of them. Take care. <laughs> God uses that somehow, like he used in Paul. Okay. Did you just so, have uh, a... Oh, okay. What was I saying? Oh, yeah. About heaven. So I think it's Revelation chapter nine, verse six, where that happens. Now, on the one hand, Christ is part of us. We are the mystical body of Christ. He is the head of the mystical body. So he is definitely connected to us. This is proven in mystical literature when mystics like Padre Pio, Teresa Neumann, Luisa Picaretta, um, Martha Robin um, underwent their passion during Lent. They're or, or Irving Hull from Michigan, stigmatist who got the stigma, stigma in his 60s. Um, these individuals, inten Christ intensified his passion in them during Lent, which means he's connected also with the church's liturgical cycle. So Christ is one with the church. He's connected to it. So if the church suffers, he experiences it necessarily. This is a divine symbiosis that God has established. What you've done to the least of these, Matthew, you've done to me. When did we not visit you in prison? When did we not clothe you when you were naked? When did we not feed you when you were hungry? What you've done to them, you've done to me. So right there, Christ says there's a connection. Of course, he suffers when we mistreat other people because his image and likeness is in them. So there's the connection. Now, in heaven, how does Christ experience this? This is a different question. Yes, he experiences this in heaven because he's still the head of the church on earth. That is on earth. But it's not a pain. It's not a suffering. It's a sorrow. Pain is physical, like me breaking my nose by an impact. I mean, banging my head against someone, that's painful, okay? Christ does not experience that in heaven. Suffering, well, let me get to sorrow first. So, sorrow is completely interior, like what Jesus reveals to Louisa in the Garden of Gethsemane. He sweat blood because on the inside, he experienced, not on the outside, the damnation of all souls despite his passion, that caused his blood to burst forth, break his capillaries and come out of his body. His sorrow was so great. This was not pain, this was sorrow. The two combined is suffering, okay? Now, in heaven, Christ experiences sorrow, okay? His body is in its glorified form, but he still experiences that sadness that interior sorrow of the souls on earth. And he wishes souls to console him in his sorrow. And this is where he asks for victim souls to help him. And Louisa would always be there for him saying, give me more suffering so I can placate the father's wrath. Because when Jesus sorrows on account of people's sins, the father's wrath ignites. And this is where chastisements come from. 
So I hope that answers that question. Father, um, going back to that, um, when when they complained, um, when God would avenge their blood, I always assumed that that they were in the bosom of Abraham because the lamb opened the sixth seal, which was next. Okay. And there was an earthquake <laughs> when he died, right? Can you say that again? I'm sorry. Okay, so you know how they were complaining to be avenged by their martyrdom? Yes, in Revelation, yes. I always assumed that was in uh, the bosom of Abraham. It had not come yet where they would... That's an interesting, yeah, that's interesting. Let's, yeah. let's go back to the actual text and read it. Now that you... The reason why I say that is the following verse, too. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's take a look. Yeah, let me go. <clears throat> But we also know that the angels are trembling in heaven now. So there is trembling too. If you read Revelation, when the bowls are about to be poured out by the angels, all of heaven's trembling, all of heaven. So there's not just fun and games in heaven. There's also interceding on behalf of the earth and trembling. Mm -hmm. So let's go back there. Yeah, we'll go to the Revelation here. I think it's 610. Um, chapter 6 verse 9 or 9 verse 6 I think I mixed it around 6 verse 9 was it 6 10 6 okay I'll go to the word 6 9 he broke the fifth seal I saw and underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slaughtered because of the witness they bore the word of God they cried out in a loud voice how long will it be, holy and true master, before you sit in judgment and avenge our blood on the inhabitants of the earth? Each of them was given a white robe. They were told to be patient a little while longer until the number was filled of their fellow servants and brothers who were going to be killed as they had been. Then I watched while he broke open the sixth field. There was a great earthquake. The sun turned black as dark sackcloth. I would think this is heaven. You know, it's under the altar of God. Remember, God's altar is above the angels and saints. It's above. According to the psalmist, he's above the cherubim. He's above the, he's above the heavens. So this is right under the altar of God. I wouldn't say it's purgatory. You will also find that in um, Revelation also, um, the heavens are, the angels are trembling. Uh, I don't know if I could pull that up on the fly here. I think it's Revelation 6. So are freaking cute. What are you going to put in them? I don't know. They're so tiny, but they're just cute. Oh, we're going to have to work on that, that mute button again. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> So like on, on uh, Revelation 6, 12, and um, I mean 11, then each of them was given a white robe. Okay, go to 12. And when I saw the lamb open the sixth seal, there was a great earthquake. That's the, at the time of his death, right? And the sun became black like sackcloth of goat hair, and the whole moon turned blood red, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth like unripe figs dropping from a tree shaken by a great wind. So I, because I, that followed, I thought that was the crucifixion. I could be, but it's also mentioned in Isaiah 13, 13, that the heavens tremble. It's mentioned also in Hebrews 12, 25 through 29, the heavens tremble. Um, and uh, I think it's also in Matthew 24, 29. Um, yeah, the heavens are shaken, Matthew 24, 29. Jesus is talking about the end times, the heavens will be shaken. There's your answer. So yeah, I think that all three of these apply uh, to the present. So it's possible. It's very much possible that, uh, you know, and in reading prophetic mystical literature, you will find that the angels are trembling right now as they are about to unleash these censor bowls upon these plagues upon mankind. And this is meta, uh, mystical language. 
but um, nonetheless, it's a preparation for the fire. Okay, we're just about at the end. We're at five o'clock. Should we wrap things up until tomorrow with a prayer? Sure. All right. We didn't do the consecration though. Yeah, we can wrap that up with the consecration prayer. Before we do the consecration prayer, we could say hello. Hello, everybody. Nice to see you out there in Divine Will Land. Hello, Father. Love Malaysia. Hello, Father. Thank hello, you, Father. Father. Hello, hello, Father. Hello, Father. Thank you, Father. God bless you. Thank you, Father. God bless you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Father. Oh, Father. Thank, you. Thank you, and God, God bless you. Thank you, Father. Hello, okay. Father. Thank you, Father. It's well, wonderful. Thank you. We'll do the divine will consecration now. Okay. Okay. If you have the divine will prayer book, it's found on page 693. And this is composed by Louisa. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O adorable and divine will. Here I am before the immensity of your light. May your eternal goodness open to me the doors of the divine will, so that I may enter and form my entire life in you, divine will. Therefore, adorable will prostrate before your light, I the least of all, join the little group of the first children of your supreme fiat. Prostrate in my nothingness, I beseech and implore your endless light to invest me and eclipse all that which opposes you. In this way, I will only look to you, desire only your knowledge, and live only in you, divine will. You shall be my life, the center of my intelligence, the enrapturer of my heart, and the captivator of my entire being. In my heart, the human will shall no longer have a life of its own, for I will banish it forever and entreat the divine will to form in me the new Eden of peace, happiness, and love. With the divine will, I shall always be happy. I shall possess a unique strength and holiness that sanctifies all things and conducts all things to God. I'm going to pause here. Um, Karen, you have the wrong prayer up. That's okay. I reverently prostrate myself and invoke the help of the Most Holy Trinity. I implore you, my God, to admit me to live in the cloister of the divine will and to restore in me the original Father, you are on mute. Okay. Where, at what point did I mute? Did, was I muted at what point? Okay, I'll go back to her prostrating herself before the Holy Trinity. Again, this prayer is composed by Louisa. When Hannibal asked her to do a consecration prayer in the divine will, this is what she composed. I reverently prostrate and invoke the help of the most Holy Trinity. I implore you, my God, to admit me to live in the cloister of the divine will and to restore in me the original order of creation that you established in the first human soul that you created. Heavenly Mother, Sovereign Queen of the divine fiat, take me by the hand and enclose me in the light of the divine will. Tender Mother, be my guide. Guard me, my child, your child, and teach me to live and maintain myself in the order and boundaries of the divine will. Heavenly Queen, to your heart I entrust my entire being. As I desire to be your little child of the divine will. If you teach me how to live in the divine will, I shall be attentive to your lessons. Cover me with your blue mantle so that the infernal serpent dare not penetrate into the sacred Eden to entice me and make me fall into the maze of my human will. Heart of my greatest good Jesus, let me share in the flames with which your sacred heart is consumed for love of us. 
so that these flames may set my heart ablaze, consume me, nourish me, and form in me the life of the supreme will. Saint Joseph, I entreat you to be my protector, the guardian of my heart, and to keep the keys of my will in your hands. Jealously hold on to my heart and never give it back to me, so that I may be sure never to leave the will of God. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And well, thank you. We just ask you for two things, Father. One, give us homework for tonight and don't make it too hard. And two, oh, okay. a blessing. Okay. All right. Your homework will be tomorrow is Good Friday. Okay. We're entering into the apex, the high point of Christ's passion, the peak of his passion. So the homework would be to meditate upon that passion experience where um, I know it's a 24 hour cycle. And since we'll be doing the talk from 12 to 5 on Friday, around the time of Christ's passion begins, he leaves at five o'clock is when we end to say he says goodbye to his mother on Friday. Well, we could begin it already tonight. We can um, meditate on, let's say, the 5 p.m. hour. It's a very short one. So it's simple homework. Meditate on the 5 p.m. hour of the passion. And uh, we will discuss that as an introduction to our next talk. All right. May the blessing of Almighty God descend upon you and remain with you. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen.